let's get started. Welcome, everybody. It is January 11th and 618. We're going to get a, this virtual meeting started. Thank you for being here. I appreciate that we have so far 92 people in this meeting, and we appreciate the engagement with your schools, and more people keep coming in, but we're going to get started because we have limited time. So I want to start by welcoming you to our budget forum. We added an extra meeting to intentionally engage with our communities and continue to collaborate meaningfully with the leadership team and the community in developing the budget. As we listen to the presentation tonight, I'll go through the agenda in a minute, but as we listen to the presentation tonight, I would like us to keep in mind our three guiding principles, and that is academic achievement, safe and healthy schools, and humanity and justice. Uh, through this budget uh, process, we have uh, the budget, the, both the leadership team and the school board are really uh, uh, purposely making sure that all our schools will maintain strong programming and also remain in alignment with our equity, our, our Vermont education quality standards. As we move into the public uh, comments, I would like you to keep in mind, or just to remind us to keep a, a growth mindset, just like we tell our kids. Uh, we are using an equity lens and equity implies a uh, call to action. Uh, remember that we're looking for progress together. That's why we are here together. Uh, we have so much as a district to be grateful for. Just look at all the community here today, our leadership team, our staff at our schools, uh, our building grounds crew, uh, especially Chris O'Brien, and so many more expend most of their holiday uh, keeping our buildings for getting pipes frozen. So we have so much to be thankful for. So keep that in mind too. So as we jump together into this brave space, uh, I'm going to remind you of a couple of things. Please be kind in your comments. Uh, everybody's working really hard in behalf of all our kids and our community. Uh, we are all in this together. Uh, let's be curious and model uh, positive behavior for our kids, uh, for our kids too. I wanna to read just that quick sentence. I took the class with Shelly. I had known about this before, but I just wanted you to read a uh, uh, not the entire poem, but I was gonna read, she introduced me to this woman who is incredible. So I'm hoping that we can hold the space uh, for all of you. And Marie Brown says, uh, we have to res the responsibility to examine what we think we know. And we know it's not going to be perfect, but we're going to try to do our best work together tonight here. So with that, we're going to start the presentation first. Uh, I, I'm going to ask the board members if there's any adjustments to the agenda. But after the presentation, we're going to let the public have their comments. We're going to strictly, we're going to have a timer and have a one and a half minutes per person just so that everybody has equitable time to give their input. And then the board is going to move into discussion and action on operations after listening, both the presentation and what the public has to say. Are there any questions about that? If not, I'm going to pass it on to Megan so that we can get started. Thank you. Thank you, Floor. Thank you, everyone. It's nice to see you. Um, and let me just get the presentation up. Okay, so I, I would just start by echoing the thanks that Floor shared um, for everyone here and for everyone in the system and, um, and for our board and administrators who are also working really hard as part of this process um, and, and a process that's as thoughtful as it can possibly be. Um, so I'm going to get started so that we can spend most of our time on the dialogue and conversation. Just a quick reminder, we always wanna ground ourselves in where we are and where we've been. So this is where we are in the process. As Floor said, this is an additional meeting that we added knowing the, the input that's been had and um, making sure we wanted to give the board a time to be able to react to what they've asked us to show them um, and have adequate input for that. So they have all the information that they need um, prior to their conversation. So that's where we are today. Next week will be the um, opportunity for the board to adopt the final budget and the warning that will go to the voters. And then we um, have our annual meeting and voting day in March. So 
for tonight, um, this presentation, you know, we hope to give you a little bit of a budget recap, um, not, not trying to recreate three previous presentations, but give you enough to be able to draw the connection between each of the conversations we've had, especially for those of you that aren't at every single meeting. Um, then we will share two drafts uh, based on what the board asked us to do in December. Um, we're calling them 3A and 3B. One of them is what the budget would look like at a 9.7% increase and one at what it would look like with a 7% increase. Um, these overviews will also give uh, tax implications for each one of those versions. Um, and that's based on the most recent tax information from the state. Uh, and then the board will have an opportunity to discuss. And just a reminder, this is a list of the original board parameters from back in November. Um, I've highlighted two revisions to what the board has asked for. One, as I said, is bringing in two versions of the budget. Um, and the second is the board has asked um, around the creativity piece, they've asked for some more specifics around proposals for what combined services could look like. So as a, as a recap, um, there are additional and much more information actually narratively in the packet. Uh, so I won't try to recreate that, but just to kind of draw the through line. In November, the first step of the process um, was to bring the board a, a presentation of a level service budget. A level service budget is what it would cost to provide exactly what we're doing this year, next year with no program changes. The outcome of that conversation was the original set of board parameters, one of which was to bring a proposal for 6%. Um, in December, the leadership team brought uh, a budget to the board, uh, draft two. Um, that budget got as far down as 7.59% increase, and that is as far as the leadership team felt they could take the budget without making structural changes. Um, as a part of that conversation, the administration was asked to come back today uh, with 9.7 and 7, and the board is understanding that that 7% would include some combined service options. Um, and the other piece in the spirit of recap, because these things are part of why we're having the conversation the way we are, is just what our realities are as a system. Um, we've talked a lot about our enrollment decline over time and continued um, from here forward, folks who've been, you know, listening to the news will know that this is not unique to Washington Central. It's something that all of Vermont and in fact, all of New England is dealing with. Um, we know we have to address the sunset of our ARP ESSER funding. That's one time funding. Next year is the last year. We know that we have inflation and economic realities, the tax implications of what we put into place. And you'll see that as part of today's presentation. And there's still a lot of things unknown in Vermont. One of them is the continuation of universal school meals, how the state chooses to use the surplus in the education fund. These are things that we don't know of yet. And those are still part of our reality. And again, showing you this, you've seen this before. These are the decision-making lenses that we have been using um, as we have these conversations. We look at how we compare to education quality, we look at how we distribute our resources and we look at student need so that we can address those three pillars that Flora talked about. And we also wanted to make sure folks know that um, the leadership team also took into, if, into consideration the conversations that have been had. The two biggest themes from our December conversation is making sure we have the time that we need to consider structural adjustments. Um, so we're giving the board some additional information about what that could look like. Um, and pretty universal and shared belief of the of the administrative team that we want to preserve quality programming for our students. Um, so with that, I'm going to start with what we're calling 3A. This is the version of the budget that um, was designed to come in at 9.7% net increase. And you'll see what it actually shakes out to be is 9.62. It's it's not really possible to hit exactly a mark like that, or at least it's pretty rare. 
Um, so again, just where that 9.7% came from, that came from the fact that the level service budget originally came in at a 9.7% increase. By the time draft two came along, that increase had gone up based on some assumptions that have changed over time. That's a pretty normal part of the process. So we chose 9.7 just to give the board a sense of what would it take to get back to where we were with that level funded budget. Um, so that's where the 9.7 came from. And um, in order to do that, we focused again on staying within education quality recommendations, creating consistency of staffing across the district. That's that equitable distribution of resources, that priority of quality education and the things that allow us to move forward the board priorities. And this version of the budget minimizes program changes in anticipation of strategic planning. So we know that we're going to engage in a process that brings a lot of community voice into helping us decide what we want for our students and then what's the structure we need to achieve that. And that's a long-term process. So this budget, this version is meant to show the board um, what would look like without those programmatic changes. So in this draft, this um, 9.62%, these are the reductions that would be um, that would be recommended in this model. There's some notes in here. I'm going to overview it. Um, this is also in the budget memo. So there would be a reduction of library media in Calis, and that would be to bring staffing into alignment with the rest of our schools, so compared to ourselves, and also remain in alignment with education quality standards. The reduction at Doty uh, would continue to be a reduction of a paraprofessional position. And that is because there is a decreased student need. This is the position that would come out of the budget because the student is no longer requiring services um, that leaves support staff in the system. One of the things that came up in December was folks wanted to see what's left, not just what was reduced. So that's what that column is. Um, this proposal would reduce 1.86 actually of a position for food service in Rumney. And that again, brings staffing into alignment with other schools. So that is what would put them on par with the other elementary schools in the building. Um, and the other thing is there are vacant positions in this area in the district. So there would be a job available for um, people impacted. And at U32, uh, the reduction would be in support staff. Uh, there would be a change in one administrative support position but the remaining positions are currently unfilled. That's part of our staffing challenge, but the, um, the three additional support staff positions could be managed um, because they are currently being managed without them. And it would still um, leave 14 instructional para positions. So I'm gonna turn it over to Suzanne for some details about the numbers associated with this version of the budget. Hi. Uh, on page 14 in the board packet, there's a comparative budget budget summary that provides a breakdown of the changes in the budget by category. Expenditures here are the amount the district plans to spend. Revenues are the, the money the district anticipates receiving to offset those expenditures. And the net education spending is the amount that needs to be raised by property taxes. The tax rate is then calculated based upon the local edu education spending per equalized pupil. And here we have a 7.4% increase in expenditures offset by a 1.31% decrease in revenues uh, for a net difference of 9.62% uh, increase in local education spending. Next slide, please. Equalized pupils have decreased 46.75 from 1,423 point five seven uh, last year to 1,376.82 this year. Uh, this is likely to be the last change that we see uh, coming from the AOE this year. So I feel confident that this is the final equalized pupil uh, for our calculations. A 9.2 change in equalized pupils equates to approximately one cent on the tax rate, which means the tax rate has increased $5 or 5.08 uh, cents just based on the change in equalized pupils. 
The local education spending per equalized pupil equates to $22,946 for draft 3A. Comparing this amount to the $15,479 property yield gives us an equalized tax rate of 1.4824. The property yield is set annually by the legislature and may change depending on the amount of unreserved or unallocated fund, funds from FY23 that are applied towards lowering the FY24 property tax rate. $15,479 assumes that nearly all of the $64 million in that fund is used. $15,479 is an increase over last year's property yield of $13,314 by $21.65. This was based around a forecasted year-over-year -year growth in education spending of 8.52% estimated statewide in November. A $104 change in the property yield would change the tax rate by a penny. The common level of appraisal for each town is then applied to equalized homestead tax rate to get the individual tax rates for each town. A CLA drop of 0.673% is about one cent on the tax rate. The CLAs for all five towns decrease significantly. The changes range uh, between a drop of 8.95% in Berlin to 5.19% in Worcester. The next slide, uh, this table applies the individual town tax rates to a house valued at $100,000, $200,000 and $300,000 to give you a picture of what it might mean to an individual household. Recognizing this is a lot of information, I just, I wanna pause here to give you a minute to review the table. And I'll turn it over to Megan. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, we do realize that that's a lot of information, as Suzanne said, hoping to give it to you in several different ways so that you can see the impact. Um, and this, this one is probably the most uh, applicable for folks. Um, so all of those numbers are, and those increases in taxes are associated with the 9.6% per uh, budget, which is draft 3A. So now I'm going to talk about draft 3B. Um, so this is the version that AIM was to get at seven. So this is about a 6.95% budget. Um, and to do that, we again continue to focus on remaining within ed quality standard recommendations. Um, this version identifies areas for combined services that could reasonably impl be implemented next year. Um, Combined services is a change to the system and, and requires work to study. So, so the elements here to bring down a seven are the ones that could be implemented next year. Again, continues to provide quality education and allow us to move forward the board priorities. Um, and just to say a little bit more about reasonable, reasonably implemented, uh, we know the board is entering a strategic planning process. The purpose of that process is to talk about what we want for our kids and what we believe we should be able to deliver to them. The structure is then what we talk about later so that we can say, what, how should we be structured in order to achieve that? But the strategic planning is to talk about with deep community engagement, what do we want for our students? Those are not quick conversations, they're long-term. Um, so this budget is meant to show you the pieces of combined services that could be done next year while that long-term planning goes along. So um, the I'm gonna give a quick summary and then I'm gonna run through, there's three slides here only because in order to give the level of detail that folks wanted in December, it doesn't fit on one slide. But the reductions in this 6.95% budget are the same as what was proposed in draft two with the addition of reductions that would come from combined services. So I am gonna run through them because there's some information in here that was requested at the last meeting. Um, but just so folks know, these are not new. Um, so again, in Calis, we're looking at reductions in library media and school counseling. This is again, 
bringing staffing levels into alignment with other schools um, and specific to school counseling, um, you know, in small schools in Vermont, there are teaching principal models, principal teacher models. And this is a form of that because of the uh, particular skill set that we have in the principal in Calis. Um, so that is, those are the Calis reductions. In Doty, we've already talked about the support staff reduction. Um, we would maintain the reduction in instructional coaching. Uh, that is a grant that is currently a grant funded position that grant would sunset and we would not replace it. And then there would be some reductions estimated to be about two thirds of a teaching position um, around combined services. I'm gonna talk about what that would be um, in a few slides, but that is where that reduction is in Doty. In Rumney, we've already talked about the food service reduction and this would retain the world language reduction. Um, world language at the elementary school would then become a part of a bigger future planning conversation about what do we want for all of our students in elementary school. Um, that would be a future conversation though. This budget would have that position reduced. And music again is an enrollment related decrease. There is FTE remaining. That was a question that came up in the last budget. It's a reduction of that FTE. At U32, we talked already in the other version about the support staff, ESP reductions, um, and this would be, uh, it would maintain the reduction of classroom teachers identified um, in the first, in the draft two budget. And across the district, what there would be is a reduction of 0.9 school nursing. This again remains, keeps us in alignment with Vermont Ed Quality Standards. This is a position that's currently funded with ESSER funding. So this money sunsets in a year anyway, and we will need to have this conversation in a year. This would move up the development of a model to understand how to serve our elementary schools um, for funding that goes away next year. So again, in a second, I'm gonna turn it back to Suzanne. She will talk about the numbers, but just to kind of recap, these are the reductions presented last month, yes, last month, with the addition of some combined services reductions that I will also talk about in a second. Suzanne. Okay, draft 3B is a 5.19% increase in expenses combined with a 1.69% decrease in revenues for a 6.95% increase in the local education spending. You'll notice that the revenues in draft 3B are lower than 3A. This is because the announced tuition is based upon the budget, so it will change depending upon which budget the board decides to warn. Next slide, please. Uh, this table exhibits the tax rates calculated across the district for 3B. The tax rates still increase in each town, but the increases range from 6.8 cents in Berlin to 0.2 cents in Worcester. The local education spending per equalized pupil equi equates to $22,388 for draft 3B. Comparing this amount to the $15,479 property yield gives us an equalized tax rate of 1.4463. If the state excess spending threshold were still in effect, it would be $22,204. After reductions for debt, capital spending, and special education extraordinary cost expenditures, both draft 3A and 3B would be under the excess spending threshold. And the next slide is a uh, projection on a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, and three hundred dollar, uh, three hundred thousand dollar house value using draft three B to project the increases. You can see that the increases on a hundred thousand dollar house range from sixty eight dollars and sixteen cents in Berlin to two dollars and twenty one cents in Worcester. And we'll pause again for a minute to allow you to consider the table. Now, 
I'll turn it back over to Megan. Thank you, Suzanne. So again, two different versions of the budget and the tax implications of them. So the last piece of information we wanted to give the board um, as requested is a little bit more information about options to combine programming that could be implemented next year. Um, these are conceptual models. There would be more detail put to exactly what this looked like. So the budget that you saw, the, the 7%, the 6.9 for 5% um, assumes some reductions based on what's here and the detailed design of these would come after. Um, but the first one I will highlight as a concept is combining pre-K programs between Middlesex and Worcester. Those are two, uh, particularly in one school, very small pre-K programs. So merging them together brings the class size into something that's instructionally a little bit more beneficial, more robust class sizes. It would likely be hosted in Romney. Um, transportation would be provided uh, for students, um, and it would serve current and incoming pre-K students. Um, and there would be a reduction in pre-K teacher as, as that was built. Another conceptual option of combined programming because of very small class sizes currently would be a combined sixth grade program between, again, Middlesex and Worcester. Um, this concept would move current fifth graders at Doty to Rumney for their sixth grade year. The class sizes would be more in alignment with education quality and Washington Central. Again, transportation would be provided and there would be FTE reduction. So again, these are conceptual ideas of things that could be pulled off in a year if the board decided that, that the 7% margin is a place that we need to be in terms of a budget our community can afford. Um, and the, the detailed planning would come later. And all of this is happening regardless of where the budget lands in the context of um, a strategic planning process, as I said. So that is the end of what we wanted to share with the board. Um, I'm going to stop sharing now so that our faces come back to the screen and I'll turn it back over to Floor. Thank you, Megan and Suzanne for that clear presentation. We're gonna move into public comments. I know there's a lot of people, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand. We'll have public comments. At, if we have too many hands up right now, we'll have public comments now and at the end of the meeting, we're gonna to try to do the bulk of the public comments right now because we really wanna use it for our deliberation. Uh, so please uh, raise your hand. We're going in order. We're going to have a little timer, like I said before, and it just mutes automatically. So I apologize for that uh, already, but we're going to try to get everybody in order. Uh, Mark, are, are you ready with that? Yes. Okay. Coming right up. Coming right up. Okay. So I'm going to start to see the order here. Here, you tell me when you're ready, Mark, and we'll get started. Sorry, I just had to switch computers. Yeah, no, no. Apologies. No need to apologize. And then the other thing that we want to tell everybody, uh, we have 129 people on, online and Liz is trying to keep track of everybody that is online. So we're going to try to do our best we can and hopefully not miss any anybody. But I also think we could use the opportunity to, if you wanted to just um, send, uh, well, maybe let me double check on that. I was thinking sending an email, but let me double check on that. Uh, Euro set, Mark. I don't want to lose time. Okay, honey, you can get started. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Honey Bean Barrett and I am currently the fifth and sixth grade teacher at Doty. The Doty staff would like to thank Mikhail and Garrity LeClaire for coming to our staff meeting today. We had a wonderfully robust conversation and staff were able to share their questions and concerns about the budget process and the cuts to Doty in budget draft three. We appreciate McKaylin bringing our questions to the whole board and we look forward to your response. 
to all board members, members of the leadership team and the WCUUSD staff, Doty is a magical place where students are thriving due to the care of the entire Doty staff. From our full-time five-star pre-K program, to our monthly spirit days, to our cross-classroom collaborations, to our student leadership program, which is embedded into the Worcester community, Doty is a magical place for students to learn what community means. We invite you to come and visit and be part of our community and part of our magic. Thank you. Thank you, honey. Okay, uh, Christina Puller, welcome. Hello. Just give me one second to mark, oh, reset, there we go. Go ahead, Christina, welcome. Hi there, I am the current preschool teacher at Doty. Um, the proposal to combine Doty and Rumney pre-K programs next year comes with great heartache. Worcester is a town rich in community from our robust food shelf to the spectacular 4th of July celebration each year. Community begins at the elementary school level. Previously, our preschool program was a small 10 hour per week program. It then grew through community connections to offer family care for three full days a week. For the last two years, we have grown to serve Worcester and Middlesex preschool students with five full days a week of care at a cost lower than private preschool programs. At a time when child care is hard to find and there's such emphasis being placed on early childhood education, losing the Doty preschool program would be irresponsible. This move would leave parents struggling to find care for their children and would leave Worcester's children without access to preschool programming, giving them a disadvantage when entering kindergarten. Our program is a, is, um, a five-star full-time preschool program with consistent staffing and programming. Mindy Audette and myself run both the preschool and community connections program, allowing for the same high level of education and care all day, every day. No other school in the district provides this level of programming. To quote the movie Field of Dreams, if you build it, they will come. We have built a fantastic community-driven, educational, and family-friendly preschool program at Doty, and the response has been overwhelmingly positive and successful. I encourage board members and members of the leadership team to visit Doty Pre-K to see just how magical our class is. I'm confident that a few short minutes would convince you as to the importance of this program. I have no doubt the preschool program at Doty will continue to grow and thrive over the next several years, and I ask the board to consider voting in a way that would allow that to happen. Thank you. Thank you. Arlen, welcome. You're still muted. <laughs> okay. There you are. Hi. Okay. Um, I'm uh, Arlen Brookley. I am the library media specialist and technology integrationist at East Montpelier Elementary School. I'd like to thank the board and the administrative team for their hard work. My hope is to use my comments to convey a deeper understanding of the work of a modern school librarian. <laughs> Everyone in this meeting has an idea of what a librarian is, but many of those understandings are based on long ago experiences. We do provide those essential services that many of us remember, reading to students, sharing book recommendations, and running the circulation desk, but we do so much more. As part of my role at, as a librarian at East Montpelier, I work to maintain a robust and diverse collection of books. This requires research and meetings with colleagues to determine important titles to support the needs of all students. A high quality library collection is one critical piece of the humanity and justice coalition work of our district. As a librarian, I teach students how to use a library and support them in seeking books that match their interest and in sparking interest in other subjects. Beyond those traditional library roles, modern librarians, teach students how to use a variety of technology tools to express their ideas, such as video and media, digital presentation apps. We work to support the development of our students as critical consumers and creators of online media. We help them to think critically about online sources of media. We teach students these skills to support them in being a di digitally literate citizens who vet sources of information, understand bias, and are able to engage in respectful debates online, skills that are absolutely essential Mark, looks like we still had seven seconds or did I miss something? <laughs> uh, my apologies, uh, different view on different screens. Oh, uh, okay. Sorry, please go ahead, I'll, I'll unmute you. Okay, Arlen, sorry. You still have seven seconds. <laughs> uh, I'm getting there.
Um, Arlen, I can allow you to unmute, but I can't unmute you. But you should be able to now. My apologies. Okay. okay. Um, I'll just close to say uh, our library and technology programs provide many of the traditional services that many of us associate with libraries. Those services are essential and to be done well are time consuming. In the 21st century, we also provide direct instruction and additional learning opportunities for the children in our community to help them have the skills they will need to participate in our democracy and thrive in a global society long after they leave our schools. Thank you. Thank you, Arlen. Jill? Can you hear me okay? Uh, yeah, we can Thank hear you. you. Uh, hold on one second. Mark, could we reset the timer? I know this is a little clunky, but <laughs> it was easy. I'm Jill Abair, librarian at U32, former librarian of Calis. Thanks hold. for allowing me to speak today. Hold, yeah, hold on one minute. Mark, I, unless my screen is showing something different, it's still I, yeah, I don't know why. I'm working on it. Sorry. <laughs> can I go while he's working? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, library it. plays an integral role in educating children for the future. It is where students learn to find, analyze, evaluate, interpret, communicate information and ideas, skills they need as adults to live and work in an information-based society. The impact your librarians have on your school community is larger than what you'd see on the surface, hence my visual of the iceberg metaphor. Research shows that where library programs are better staffed and funded, academic achievement tends to be higher. Research shows a direct link between higher reading scores and collaboration between librarians and teachers. This month in School Library Journal, an article features a pediatrician who recommends books to her patients. She says she uses books to make kids laugh, to help kids process hard times, and to let kids know they're not alone. My patients have told me that certain titles allow them to feel that they are valid, worthy. What will they do without access? What happens if I tell a patient a book will help them, but when they go to their school library, it's not there? So I'm speaking today with concerns about the cuts in the library program. Each year, these positions are chipped away at, creating a further divide in the skills our students have when arriving at U32. If we continue on this path, students will miss out on important instruction. Your librarian is the only person in the building hired to curate a collection that's inclusive and helps build empathy. Your library is a place where students are welcome with open arms, where they are met and encouraged to challenge themselves beyond their potential. Your libraries are more than just places where books are kept. They are vital places in your community. During the pandemic, our schools delivered food and books to our students. We understood that those vital needs to feed our bodies and our minds are the most important resources we can Thank you, Jill. I'm we're just going to do it uh, manually. We have a tim timer going on. I apologize, Jill, but I think we we totally understand what you're what what you're saying. We have a lot of hands up, so I apologize and thank you. Please sit, submit it on writing to us. I see that you have a document, so make sure that you send it to to Megan and myself, and we'll share it with the board. Okay, and let me. Um, Stacy. All right, are you ready? Yes. Okay. Good evening. My name is Stacy Rupp, and I have been the Library Media Specialist and Technology Integrationist at Callis since 2018. Prior to this, I was a fifth and sixth grade classroom teacher at Callis for five years, and before that, a paraeducator at CES for many years. So the story of my teaching career is very much a story of the opportunity that rural schools can provide for new educators. I have been with Callis through nearly 15 years of learning, change, growth, tragedy, and triumph. And I am not a resident of Callis, nor indeed of any of its neighboring towns. What kept me returning here was the school's steadfast dedication to high quality teaching, to engaging student and staff curiosity and identity, and to the community support for a vibrant program beyond the three R's of old. A major part of this vibrant program is its library, which serves as a hub of engagement that is far more than a book repository or a location for students to visit once a week for 30 minutes. As my library colleagues can attest, a robust education requires a dedicated library professional to help guide student learning both within and outside the library walls. Information and the acquisition thereof are not static and cannot be taught well just once a week in isolation. 
Collaboration is the cornerstone of good teaching and reducing this school's program by even half leaves zero time for callous librarians to push in, take small groups or consult with teachers. By reducing this position, you will lose the spark that keeps highly qualified and dedicated professionals returning to this school, growing in their practice and integrating into the community. Our students are bombarded by initiatives that reduce them to mere data points. Thank you, Stacy. I know that it feels harsh, but I'm so sorry. Avery, welcome. Thanks for being here. Hi, well, thank you. Um, my name is Avery and I am a junior from Callis and my library experience is ongoing and I know the incredible positive effects of a full-time librarian. Throughout my elementary experience, I had the amazing Jill Aver as my librarian and she still is, thankfully. And some of my best elementary school memories took place in the library. It had always been a place for me to go and talk about what I saw to be the best thing in the whole world, books. They are what kids can use to see into entirely new perspectives, as well as learn more about themselves. Books help kids learn empathy and kindness towards others. And librarians are an integral part of getting books to kids. And now that I'm in high school, I find a library to be the safest place for me in the school. And as a student, I expect our school to have full-time librarians everywhere because they are truly an invaluable resource and because students need them to have the greatest success. Thank you. Thank you, Avery. Steve, welcome and go ahead. Hi, um, I'm Steve. My wife, Catherine, and I uh, moved to Worcester recently with our uh, newborn and our two and a half year olds um, in uh, large part because of the great public schools. And uh, we're particularly concerned about the proposed closure of the Doty pre-K program um, and a couple of questions uh, on that front. Um, one is um, where the um, predicted cost savings are expected to occur precisely. If it's a uh, cut to a uh, full-time teacher, um, then we're wondering um, what is going to happen if um, your predictions about class size are incorrect and whether there will be enough room if there are um, more than the expected number of um, Worcester pre-K students. And, um, and also um, what, um, what other cost savings uh, are predicted from this and um, how those were calculated, uh, as well as how the um, uh, predictions about the class size uh, were reached, like what data was used and um, and how that came to be. Um, I think that's it. Thank you, Steve. We took note of all the questions. Ali? Ali, do you want to go ahead? I have you as Ali in the... I'm gonna ask you to unmute and see if that helps. I think your camera is frozen, Ali. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna jump to Lauren. Well, I communicate with Ali. Okay, go ahead, Lauren. Hi, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Lauren Chabot, and I'm a Worcester resident and parent. I find the proposal which would require Doty students to attend pre-K and sixth grade at Rumney to create a huge inequity for Worcester students and families. Pre-K and sixth grade are pivotal transition periods in schooling, mandating a small subset of the student body to endure an additional transition, and in the case of sixth graders, only one year before the transition to U32, at a time of dramatic cognitive and social emotional development is unfair for Doty students. No other students in the district will have this type of disruption in their education. Additionally, according to the 2021-22 annual report, 44% of Doty students qualified for free and reduced lunch, the greatest percentage of any of the elementary schools in the district. Therefore, this inequity is being applied to the population that is already facing challenges. This restructuring, restructuring has been proposed without any input from the community, which it will impact, and the impact is huge. 
The relationships my children are forming at Doty are irreplaceable and not transferable from one building to another. The sense of safety, respect, and belonging developed at Doty directly impacts my children's academic achievements. The foundation of these relationships is built solidly in the Doty pre-K program. My child will be ready to learn on day one of kindergarten because of this. And from what I have seen, the sixth graders at Doty are kind, confident students and leaders of their community. They deserve to remain a part of the community they built for the entirety of their elementary education. This may look easy on paper, but the impact is frankly unconscionable for students and I will not support a budget. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, Ali, is it, uh, I'm here. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Ali. Okay, and, it, I'm and sorry, I lost connection for a second there. No worries. Um, Go ahead. My name is Ali Mayany, and I'm the librarian at Romney and Doty. And I thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk about the potential impacts of library cuts and other cuts in our district. Reducing a librarian position impacts a library program. A well-resourced school librarian program offers students more than just an opportunity to check out books. We offer maker spaces where students learn to create and engineer things. We teach coding and robotics, information literacy, technology, and digital citizenship skills. I can give you data like how many thousands of books are checked out each year or how we manage resources that are worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. What is harder to quantify, however, is the confidence in a fifth grade boy who has always hated reading and finally finds a book in verse about basketball worth his time or the young girl who reads a story about being black in a rural community, or the gratitude of a parent whose child is finally hooked on reading, or the relief of a classroom teacher when we find an audio book or an accessible tech tool for their student. Reducing and removing positions leads to staff turnover, poor morale, unfilled positions, and very part-time staff, which puts enormous stress on our schools. It is harder to build and sustain a community. We know that trusting relationships take time to develop and are the cornerstone of good education. Cuts to student-facing positions impacts our historically marginalized students and small communities the most. Some of our students in schools have... Thank you, Ali. Uh, we're gonna move into uh, Lauren Frank. I'm, I meant for you to go before and I'm sorry I didn't use the last name. I apologize for that, but welcome. And this is your time, go ahead. Hi, I'm, I'm Jesse, my wife, Lauren. We're here with uh, concerns with almost all the cuts that are going on at school, uh, at all of the schools in our community. Uh, a school is a lifeblood of the community. Our children are our future. And um, I would rather see the school grow and so we can enrich our children's lives more. Um, to use an example in history, we're pulling out of the Great Depression. We do things like the Federal Arts Act to enact arts to pull ourselves up and out of a dark time. So if we destroy our programs, we have no, nothing to attract people to our towns. This is one of the, this, uh, this region of Vermont is one of the best kept secrets uh, with our, because of our education, because of the community that, that we have built here. So seeing these cuts uh, to me, frankly, is, uh, kind of unacceptable to food, library, service, foreign language. These are all skills that our children are gonna need in the future. So I would rather see a budget uh, that is based on growth of services to enrich our children's lives and enrich the lives of all the people who know and love our children, the people who are working at the school. Um, there's where my concerns lie not uh, small percentages on, on paper. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jessica? Hi there. Um, I do want some clarification around what a sustainable school health model would look like to the administrative and leadership teams. Um, but at the meeting on 1221, I spoke about historically underserved students. These students are often in need of more support and are often seen in the nurse's office more frequently. Additionally, the students in our most rural schools can have less access to health care. This year, 30% of Doty students did not see their primary care provider in the last year. This is up from 16% in the previous school year. These disparities will continue to become apparent as the fallout from the pandemic continues. 
Our most rural schools are set to lose ESSER funded school nursing positions. Doty and Rumney nurses are both currently partially funded by ESSER. At Doty, we are 20 to 30 minutes from a hospital. In my tenure there, we have had to call the ambulance for a student. It took about a half hour for the ambulance to arrive. And if the student had needed to be transported, it would have taken another half hour. One, emer one hour from the emergent situation. If there had been no nurse, I'm afraid to think of what might have happened. School nurses play a crit critical role in managing the physical, emotional, mental, and social needs of students while conducting health screenings, facilitating compliance with health mandates, and reducing burdens on educators and staff, all while supporting a positive and healthy school climate. Leaving our schools with less than full-time nursing coverage is irresponsible. Thank you, Jessica. Becca. Hi, everyone. My name is Becca Mandel. I'm a parent of two kids at Rumney, one in um, kindergarten and one in second grade who is here. They're both here, actually. Um, and I just I want to echo a lot of what has been said here. And I, I think with the, um, the 3B budget that proposes the restructuring, which is actually pretty significant restructuring at, at Doty and Rumney, um, I actually think that those changes really need to happen as part of a much larger community process. They are really really drastic and severe, and I think um, do not belong in a quick um, budget process like we're having right now. Um, and they, uh, one of the things that, um, sorry, there's a lot I wanna say and my minutes are ticking down, <laughs> my seconds are ticking down. Um, so I just, you know, we wanna keep our schools vibrant because that's what attracts folks here. And I'm really struck by our declining enrollment numbers seem to be predominantly in towns where there isn't broadband yet. There's not high-speed internet. We saw a lot of COVID refugees. We're gonna see a lot more climate refugees coming to our communities. Our district is so desirable. We're near Montpelier, we're near recreation, we're near so many great things. Cutting the programming at our schools, cutting our schools, um, is actually a really, uh, I think, short-sighted plan right now as we're gonna see more and more people moving in as we get broadband finally so that people can move in and live in our communities. So I think we should not fund uh, a, such a, a, but not the lower level budget and make these changes after a long community process. Thank you. Thank you, Becca. Uh, Dina? Thank you. Um, my name is Deanna Murray. I am the preschool teacher at Rumney School. Um, it is stated on page four of this meeting's packet that all of these reductions would allow our schools to maintain robust programming for our students. My concern is how are we maintaining this robust programming with significant cuts across our district, specifically speaking about the reduction of library programs, um, completely cutting Spanish at Rumney, and not having kids at their local schools. And that last piece is in regards of moving Doty Preschool and Doty Sixth Grade to Rumney next year. As the preschool teacher at Rumney, um, I feel the need to express the importance of having preschool aged children in their local school in order to start building a sense of community in the town where they reside. Uh, Doty Preschool, uh, it must be noted, is an absolutely high quality program and should be kept exactly where it is. Um, I think it's also important to note that the people that will be affected uh, by these cuts are people that are part of our community um, and that care deeply about the schools and, and the communities where we live. Thank you. Thank you, and I apologize that I mispronounced your name. Uh, Mark Brown? I can't see you, but I see your hand is up. Hi, Mark, welcome. Hi. Just turn my video on. Um, time to go. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you to the board for doing this additional meeting. Thank you to Megan for all the work to create two new budgets. My name is Mark Brown. I'm a teacher at U32, a Calis resident. My wife is a paraprofessional at Calis Elementary, and I have two sons at Calis Elementary. And I'm lucky enough to be Avery Cochran's TA at U32. In other words, this district's welfare and my family's welfare are inextricably linked. My boys, all students at Calis, and all the students in our district need librarians five days a week. Librarians help build a love of reading. They help our kids to explore our world. They serve as a valuable refuge for many of our kids who need a quiet and calm and peaceful place at school. I heard you say that this cut at Calis would make it equal to other schools in the district. 
I believe some of our elementary schools do have full time librarians. So I wonder if bringing cows in line is related to per pupil librarians. But anyway, at the last meeting, some board members supported the idea of using the fund balance to help lessen the tax impact of preserving our programs. I didn't hear that idea tonight. I would sincerely encourage the board to consider doing that for next year and lead a district wide discussion of structural changes so we can talk less about what we're taking away from our kids and how we strengthen these beautiful programs we already have. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Brittany Powell. Hi. Can you hear me? Um, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Uh, my name is Brittany Powell. I'm a current parent of a Doty pre-K student. Um, it's true, the program at Doty is magical. My son uh, began at attending Doty after facing several really difficult transitions and other programs where we were commuting upwards of 45 minutes each way to drop him off for childcare when both my husband and I work from home. Um, so as a two parent full-time working household, our family chose to send our son to Doty because it, because it was the only full-time available program in the area. We're really sad and frustrated at the proposed change in programming in a time when there is increased dialogue and pressure for action to address the crisis and access to affordable early education programming in Vermont, cutting and combining programs seems incredibly short-sighted. Asking Worcester parents to choose between busing young students under five or driving them to neighboring schools doesn't provide an equitable way to access education for our youngest students, or does it signal an investment in their potential and the needs of working parents? Asking current Doty families to transition their kids to new programs and situations is a huge disruption to both education and the health of working families. Thank you. Thank you. Jasper? Hi, can you hear me? Can yes. Me? Perfect. Yes, we can hear you. A little right. bit louder would be great. All right, hi. My name is Jasper. I am the current senior at U32. I use they, them pronouns. In third grade, I transferred to Calus Elementary School from Waldorf School, and due to the nature of Waldorf Schools, I entered completely and utterly unable to read. Um, the Calus Library was integral to my journey as a student, and I was able to catch up solely due to the library. Um, during that journey, it often became a refuge and a safe haven for me, like it does for many neurodiverse, queer, or other marginalized students. Um, in third grade, I entered and unable to read. By the end of sixth, I had left Alice being I, able to read at a college level. I had read basically every book in the fantasy section and I had helped J.L.A. Bear categorize it. Um, librarians, not just the physical space, are incredibly integral to the growth of students. And they provide a lot of support, safety, and security to students and to cut that, opportunity and help in half is just completely unconscionable to me. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Jasper. We appreciate it. Um, appreciate the it. next, uh, hmm. Davis? I'm not sure of S.A. Davis. I'm not, I can't see a face, so I don't know who it is. Oh, there. Yeah, I'm here. Welcome. <laughs> I can't see it's, it's a little dark. So if you don't mind introducing yourself and please get started, you have one minute and 30 seconds. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. So my name is Sarah Davis. I'm a Worcester resident and I have a two year old who's with me that I was planning to send to Doty next year. And in fact, one of the reasons that I moved to Worcester was because of Doty and the ability to start our daughter there and have her move all the way through pre K and elementary school at the same place. Um, and to be part of a community that is our own community and to have her have continuity and security as she moves through that. Um, and so sorry, as you can see, I'm actually really disturbed by the combined services model between um, Dodie and Romney because early childhood care is at a complete crisis level in this area, especially in the more rural communities. And those are the ones that are being affected the most by these proposals and forcing parents to send their three and four year olds to a non-local school and for sixth graders to have to spend this like random year at a different school um, just isn't a workable proposal, I think. And I understand that the board is trying to come up with creative solutions to a very challenging budget client, but climate, but 
I think cutting programming to our youngest kids right at these really sensitive points in their education just doesn't seem like the right approach to that. Um, again, early childhood care is just at a complete crisis level here. There are literally no other options for people with young children. Wait lists at private programs are literally in the hundreds if you can even get on at all. And so I just think it's incredibly important to maintain these programs for, um, for communities here, especially the smaller ones. Thank you. Thank you. I just realized that I was going by the pictures and I still have some people on the side. So I'm going to ask Caitlin. My finger clacked. Oh, okay. Mama, my finger clacked. Somebody's My finger clacked. Hey, so by you're on mute at. Okay. okay. I found this on the web for Byron. Are you ready for me? Yes. Okay. Hi, my name is Caitlin Hawanski and I am a Worcester resident. I moved to Worcester to raise my children in a loving community where they are known and valued as individuals. Both my husband and I had education experiences where we were just an anonymous number, broadly shuffled around based on budget or administration needs. I'm horrified to think that the same thing could be occurring for my children, a pre-K student last year, and one who's upcoming in the 24-25 school year, uh, as such effects are long lasting. My schooling was also at so-called robust levels and the levels at Doty are far superior. Practically speaking, I will either have to put a three-year-old on the bus for how long, or put my then six-year-old on the bus for well over an hour. Either of these benefit my children or my family. I'm also relying on the Doty pre-K program as the only full-time pre-K program in the district. It's only because of this I've been able to return to my career and without it, I do not know what I will do. Further, I very much want to encourage the board to maintain the current level of staffing for a school nurse. Illness and need do not follow a schedule. When students or staff are in a building, there is a need. My son utilized the school nurse just today, and I am so glad that Nurse Jess was there for him. Further, I would like to add, what are we as a society if we are not willing to spend our money on quality education for our youngest people? Thank you. Thank you. Meg? Meg, can you hear me? I can, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Go ahead. Okay, great. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Meg Allison. Thank you for your time. I'm a teacher librarian at U32, as well as the current past president of the Vermont School Library Association. I'm here to advocate not only for retaining the current level of service at the Callis School Library, but to propose full-time librarians at all of our schools. Our national library standards state that school libraries must facilitate opportunities to experience diverse ideas by promoting the use of high quality and high interest literature in formats that reflect the diverse developmental, cultural, social, and linguistic needs of all our learners. The updated educational quality standards ensures that all students will have access to print, multimedia, and alternate technology formats that represent the diversity of students' personal experiences. Our school libraries are places that are uniquely designed to support the work and vision of the Act One Working Group. The goals of the EQS updates are ambitious. They aim to ensure that equity is at the center of everything we do in schools. They aim to create safe and inclusive spaces for all students. As a school district committed to equity, justice, and inclusion, as articulated through our Humanity and Justice Coalition, I ask that our school board provide full-time library services at all our schools. Ultimately, I believe that the libraries of the WCUUSD provide a strong foundation for our students as we co-create equitable, anti-racist, culturally responsive, anti-discriminatory, inclusive places for all. Thank you, Meg. Talitha hey. um, Landis? And I apologize if I mispronounce your name. Please introduce yourself. Or is it you, Kyle? I can't see a visual. Hi, I'm Mela. I'm a ninth grader at U32. The library is my favorite place in the school, and the librarians are some of my favorite people. The library and librarians support and benefit everyone, including the faculty, whether it's helping you find a book, providing you with resources to learn about something, or teaching media and technology skills. Libraries foster learning and creativity, and librarians are necessary for this to happen. The school board should not cut the library budget or the working hours for librarians in our district because our school community would be less creative, less fun, and with a lot less learning and creative 
thinking without them. I would also like to add that cutting the other budgets, such as music and Spanish, uh, also should not happen because those were some of my favorite uh, parts of school as a student. My name is Talitha. I'm going to chime in. Thank you for this additional meeting. Thank you very much for communicating about these meetings. I appreciate the communication. Um, I would like to see level service next year, and I would like to let you let the communities vote and decide on these tax increases. We may just decide that we'd pay a little more to see our schools remain level service, complete, no changes. Um, I've also heard the phrase alignment with other schools quite a bit. I'd like to see this strategy and philosophy used to raise people up, not as a race to the bottom. Thank you very much for listening tonight. Thank you. Amy? Amy Young. Hi, my name is Amy Young, and I'm the librarian and tech integration specialist at Berlin Elementary School. Thank you for giving us time to speak. I'm going off script because a lot of things I would want to say have already been said. I would like to echo the idea of raising our libraries up rather than bringing them down. I've watched my good friend Ali struggle to maintain two libraries um, at a two day and a three day uh, level. and She's just drowning in it. And um, to give you a little history, I've been there 16 years. Before me, there was a full-time librarian, straight librarian with a, an assistant that was cut. I was hired um, as a librarian. It's been, my job has changed. I've been, stuff has been added. I've been made into being a librarian and tech integrationist so I wouldn't lose my job. Um, they just pile more and more on and I don't want to see that keep happening to the other libraries. I depend on a volunteer that comes at least three, sometimes five days a week from one o'clock to 3.30 to keep me above water, to keep me from drowning in all of the work. And I am able to offer makerspace and book lunch groups because of that volunteer help. But if we keep cutting away, all of the good stuff that we can offer is just going to be gone to the wayside. So I want to build us up rather than tear us down. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Danielle, welcome. Hi. Um, I don't know if you can see me, but I'm here with my beautiful daughter, Sophia, who's in grade five at um, uh, East Montpelier Elementary School. And on Friday, she brought home this book. I don't know if you can see it, but the cover of the book has a beautiful black girl on it. And I know this is because of her librarian who has made this available to her. She came home, she talked for about a half hour about how excited she was about this book. And I am grateful for Arlen and for all of the library services. And in terms of the humanity and justice role, it's right here, it's right here in my hand. And I um, really wanna say that the library services are crucial. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Danielle. Hey, Sarah? Can you hear me, Sarah? Yeah. There you are. Can you hear me? Yep. Can you hear yeah. me okay? Okay. Yeah, I can. Hi there. My name's Sarah. Um, I am a parent of two children at Doty. Um, we moved here a couple years ago, and the pre K program specifically was a godsend to our family um, and was a huge reason why this specific um, town worked for our family. Um, I can't even imagine not having that program. It is like, Incredible. Um, what Chrissy and Mindy have built in just a couple of short years is nothing short of amazing. Um, it would be devastating to our community to not have that program. Um, I feel fortunate that um, I don't need to have that for the full time, but I know so many of my friends need to have that full time access to um, childcare. Um, and there are many of my friends who are um, transplants to this community as well. Um, who are coming into this um, district with young ones and are also needing that kind of full-time care. Um, something specifically that came to mind was that, um, so we have two kids. So like if we had come into this di district, my 
three-year-old at the time would have, in this situation, gone to Rumney while my seven-year-old went to Doty. Like their siblings are going to get split up because of this. And with so many new people coming into the district, um, it just breaks my heart. And quickly, um, as far as a school nurse goes, I have lots of thoughts, but um, I believe that is irresponsible and, and does not reflect the guidelines of a safe and healthy school. Um, and my family is, my son has Tourette's. I can't continue, but Thank you, Sarah. Shani, welcome. Thank you so much. Um, I just, I wanna, I'm Chani Waterhouse. I live in Worcester. I'm a parent um, and a resident. And I wanna just start with um, expressing my deep gratitude for the board. I'm a former board member, the finance team, the leadership team, the faculty and the staff. I know how hard the work is that you're doing and how heavy it weighs on your hearts. I know we're all here because of how much we love kids and want the best for them. And um, so the, what's weighing heaviest on my heart is how structural changes that are already happening, that I'm already seeing in the SU, as well as those being proposed um, may impact community connectedness for kids. There is a lot of data confirming that community connectedness is a protective factor for children and youth and supports better outcomes across a wide range of life experiences. Worcester is a town with relatively high numbers of families impacted by socioeconomic hardship. It's also a town with, I think, relatively strong community connectedness. Um, kids need to feel held by a loving multi-generational community. Let's not rush into structural changes without time to understand big impacts, especially for the kids who are already having the hardest time, and consider how we could be investing in parental engagement, support, and community connectedness. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jenny. Amy Rose? My name is Amy Rose, and I'm a Middlesex resident and a parent of children at Rumney and U32. I want to start by thanking you for hosting this forum. I am deeply concerned that none of the budget options presented include budget recommendations that do not include cuts and consolidations. With the current rate of inflation, we should expect school budgets to increase. I am willing to accept the tax burden and to think creatively to ensure that our school community remains whole. These proposed cuts are not simply positions, but humans. The humans who fill these roles are members within our community and they are valued. Collectively, these individuals and their roles support our children every day. They fill in when others are out sick. They expand our children's minds and offer countless opportunities for all our kiddos. Creating a space where our children are offered an opportunity to practice the love of learning, build deep curiosity, and experience human connection is critical. Reducing staff impacts morale and it leaves scars. My seventh grader was shocked by the consolidation recommendations. Please get more input before making shifts during these critical moments in the development of our children. I'm disheartened that the term equity is being used in an effort to reduce opportunities. I've always celebrated equity as a means to expand opportunities for those most marginalized rather than take away resources from all. I've always voted in favor of our school budgets and I'm proud of that. However, I'm not confident that we can vote for a budget that causes harm. Our children are... Thank you, Amy. Melinda? Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes, welcome. Uh, hello, well, um, hello, thank you. Uh, my name is Melinda Adet. Um, I work in the Doty Pre-K program with Chrissy Pollard. And I just wanna start off by saying I echo everything that Chrissy said. Um, all of my children have attended Doty Pre-K and to think that other families in the Doty community wouldn't be given the same chance to experience the love, passion, and quality care that Chrissy and myself provide for everyone in the community. It just is uh, saddening that that is even on the table. Um, my second part before, I don't want to run out of time, would be that um, my daughter happens to be one of the fifth graders that is moving, that they're thinking about moving. And so I just want to say that as a parent, I think that moving my fifth grader to Rumney during the last year of elementary school is a mistake and that she already has anxiety and fears about moving up to U32 in the next coming years. So to rip her out of Doty a year earlier than to attend a new school where she has no supports or relationships would be physically and mentally tolling, especially when 
so many of them have looked forward to being sixth graders with Dodi and sharing the same Dodi traditions that their siblings and family and friends have experienced. Um, as an educator, I ask and question if the physical, mental, and um, educational well being of the fifth graders have been taken into account since they've endured so much in the past two years to make them think that they are going to. I'm going to run out of time, but I just feel passionate about that, and I think that we shouldn't be moving them. Thank you, Melinda. Uh, Lisa, and then I have Michael and Kathy, and then we'll move into the board deliberations. Um, so go ahead, Lisa. Thank you. My name is Lisa Hanna. I'm a Worcester resident and former fifth and sixth grade teacher at Doty. I have two kids at Doty currently. Um, and for one, I would just like to thank everyone who's spoken so far um, and echo everything that everyone has said um, about the district as a whole and about Doty. Um, I, I just have one clarifying question without repeating a lot of feeling strong feelings and emotions that everyone has said, but um, one clarifying question I would have um, that I haven't seen yet the answer to is um, with the proposed restructuring of Doty at the sixth grade level, uh, what does that look like for the rest of Doty? Um, having a five, six classroom with uh, small class sizes, does that also impact the rest of the structure of Doty? What would the fifth graders do? Um, I, I would just be curious what the board um, is thinking about that or what the administrative team is thinking about that. Um, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Michael, can you hear me, Michael? Um, okay, can you hear me? You are, yeah, I can hear you. I can't see you, but I can hear you. Welcome, Michael. Uh, okay. I'm not sure if I can do the video, but anyway, <clears throat> so a couple of quick things. One is as a uh, taxpayer and homeowner in Middlesex, <clears throat> I would uh, really not favor this budget and probably vote it down because my property values will go down. I am much better off paying a little more in taxes every year to support strong schools than to see people leave town to go to other school districts. <clears throat> so that's an economic impact. The other is in your creative pursuit, have you thought about redrawing the shed, the, the draw lines for these schools? In other words, you're talking about Middlesex, Worcester, Cowles. There are schools in those towns, but maybe it makes more sense to think about who lives near those schools. Draw a five mile circle, a 10 mile circle. <clears throat> and I think you need some time to <clears throat> consider that. So I also echo this being way too radical a change for doing on, on the fly like this. There's a lot of, <clears throat> I think unintended consequences that people have raised. So I really urge you not to pursue such a big change in this method. Thank you, Michael. Kate, I see you now. Sorry, I say it, Kathy, I shouldn't see it, but I see you now. Go ahead, Kate. Um, thank you, Flirt. I don't have anything rehearsed. I've got Bodhi here. Um, Michael, I think everything you just said, I don't know you, but that just rang so true to me. I feel like more communication and conversation about all of these cuts would is what we need, especially with consolidation. It um, From the last board meeting to this one, it just breaks my heart. I grew up in East Montpelier and moved to Middlesex specifically for the quality of the primary teachers and specifically the Spanish program. Um, and I also do the school nurse subbing for Rumney and Doty and U32. Um, and all of these cuts really, I'm just, I would so much rather have a larger conversation about the budget and um, potentially increasing that rather than potentially sacrificing all of these incredible programs, which is why we chose to live here. So, um, Anyway, there's a lot more that I'd like to say about the nursing piece because I've had the privy of being able to do the nurse subbing at three of the different schools for almost six years now. And I have a lot of insight about that, but um, I just, I think the more conversation we can have about that would be really beneficial. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Okay, with, the, with that, we're gonna conclude the public comment part of the meeting. Mark, do you mind taking out that? Oh, I, 
taking out the timer. I see that a couple of the hands, oh no, Kate, that's your hand, Kate, that is coming up. It, Kathleen, I don't want to be rude and exclude anybody, but yes. just, it, I can't see Hi. you. Yeah. Okay, okay this is gonna be the last comment to get everybody that is in there and then we'll get started. So if you would give me a minute, I'm just gonna start the manual timer. Okay, go ahead. Hi, sorry, it's really dark, I'm in my car. I just wanna offer something that hasn't been said tonight. I'm actually a Worcester resident. My name is Kathleen Bookchin. And um, I've actually already left your district this year. I've put my kid in private school because I wasn't fulfilled enough with what is currently happening at the Worcester and the Washington Central Supervisory Union District. So to think that we are actually considering further cutting is emotionally upsetting, obviously, from what you've heard tonight. And I just wanted to offer that too. I think that you're cutting library, you're cutting Spanish, you're cutting music, uh, you're cutting some of the food. Uh, staffing, I just, again, I echo what Talitha said as far as let's increase our education in our communities, let's not cut it. And I think if you gave the taxpayers an ability to make a choice, I too would like to shut this down and raise our communities up, not further cut them. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Okay, uh, now that we have, I'm just gonna stop this. Okay, so, right, there we go. Didn't want the timer to go on. So before, uh, and I'm gonna run this by the, the board, but so we're gonna move into our third part of the night. Uh, we are nine minutes past our <laughs> ending time. So I'm assuming board members that we're gonna be here for a little while. We're gonna move into the board operations and the discussion of the, of the budget, uh, the documents that we received. Before we get started, I was wondering if we could address some of the key questions uh, that, that were raised, or do you rather have a, each individual board member ask a question? I was, I was hoping, this is my thinking, I was hoping that we could talk a little bit, just a couple of snippets on preschool. There, there's some misconceptions uh, that I want to clear uh, a little bit about library and a little bit about uh, what does it look for the Doty community uh, with the, the numbers on the sixth grader. Is, is that fair for the staff and the leadership team? Megan, I'm looking at you and please say no if this doesn't make any sense at all, but I think it will help while the community is still here too. Mm -hmm. No, sure. That's no problem, Floor. Um, I'll respond to the questions that I think we can respond to right now. Um, and there's one that I don't know if we can, but I will put it into the room and ask. Um, and then, then I think we can move on um, because I, not everything I, we would be able to respond to. So the first thing I would say um, is more of a, of a comment and a reminder. Um, the concept of a pre-K combined services program First of all, the goal is actually to create a more robust program that can be done when there is scale. So there were a couple of comments about full day and half day. Those are conversations that could come out of the planning of what the program would look like together. Um, it is not an elimination of a program. The goal would be to serve all students and potentially serve more students than it currently serves. So that's more of a clarification. There was a question about what would happen if enrollment projections are not accurate? Um, what would happen then? So I would say two things. One, I would remind the board that um, our enrollment decline has sustained over time. So the predictions several years ago have held. Um, those predictions come from kind of demographic analyses and those things um, that is an internal analysis. We also have an external firm that does most of the work around New England to kind of compare our numbers to. Um, that's where they come from. Um, we do not have evidence to suggest that we would have huge enrollment gains. Um, that said, any board, any community, if there were a spike in enrollment that caused class sizes to be high, the board would have to come together and address that. Um, but I do want to be clear that our enrollment projections have held very well over the past number of years. Um, and by that, I mean they have declined. 
and the predicted decline has been uh, met and if anything exceeded. So there was that piece. There was a question around what would the sustainable school health model be? And the answer to that question is we need to design it. Um, that is something we have to do anyway. We have to do that because the additional FTE put in with ESSER funds, the funding for that goes away. So they're already in a year would need to be a conversation about designing that. So administration doesn't have the immediate answer. There would be a process that includes engagement with our nurses and our faculty and staff around designing that. Um, and... The question floor that I don't know that I can answer off the top of my head is what would the classes look like in Doty if grade six were to move? I, I would start by saying, and then Gillian, it, you can either tell me that you can answer it or not. Um, because of the kids moving up, uh, there, would, uh, there would be class sizes that made sense with what is left because the group that would be moving if that model were to be put in place is very small. Gillian, do you have a sense of what this class sizes would look like or would we need some more time to be able to describe that? Um, we would need more time to describe and to, to talk through because at this point it is a, it's a concept um, and something to put on the table as a consideration and, and it's not a thought through model. Thanks, Gillian. So Floor, that's the list of things that I feel like we could respond to off the top. Happy to respond to board questions during their conversations, but. I guess the, the other one that I had written here, I think there was a perception that we were losing library or having less money for books or, you know, so could, I, I don't know if Kat or you can, talk to that. There were a lot of Calais residents. So I, I just want to make sure that we can, the board has that information, not necessarily responding to public comment at this moment, because we will respond to public comment, but just getting some information so that it informs our discussion. Yes, thank you for that, Floor. Um, first of all, there is no reduction in this budget to supply lines, library budgets, how, how they function in terms of uh, what books are allowed and not allowed. Um, it really is a reduction that brings the staffing into alignment with the proportions in other systems. Um, Kat, I can't see you on my screen, so I can't see your face and whether or not uh, it, if you had would have anything to add to that. The only thing that I would add is um, I this is my eighth year um, working on the budgeting process and I um, have been looking at the declining enrollment for Calis for quite some time and the predict the projections from eight years ago about where we would be on this day are pretty spot on and it it does hurt my heart a little bit to see things change so I just want to be honest about that I'm a Calis taxpayer I grew up and went to Calis and U32 I am invested in this community and I don't want to see things change. And I want to show my care for kids by doing what's best for them and what is student centered. And that is programming that is student centered and fiscally responsible for our taxpayers. Many years ago, we realized with this decline in enrollment, we needed to make a change in the number of FTEs in our classroom um, teachers. And over the last few years, we have begun to make commensurate cuts in FTE across our allied arts so that the that so that students are getting everything that they need in a way that um, does not have to adjust every time there's an ebb and flow. We have not yet done that with library. Callis is down to 92 students today and the projections for next year are lower. I don't think that we need a full-time librarian and can still offer. Do I have the exact answer about exactly what we need to right size um, the circulation and library and tech and all of those wonderful elements that all of the people spoke about today? I don't have that right now. I just know we don't need a full time. Thank you, Kat. Thank you, Megan. Uh, I think with that, uh, we're, we're gonna move into discussion uh, and this will be a conversation with you guys uh, still. Uh, the Finance Committee met uh, yesterday 
And we have not a motion uh, recommendation just to get the conversation uh, framed uh, today. The, the feeling of the finance committee and finance committee members could raise their hands, so it's just not just uh, me, was that we, uh, that we should start a conversation with 3B. And the recommendation of the finance committee was to recommend 3B to the full board. I can go down the list of, of, of why, but I want to keep it open-minded for each board member to be able to reflect in, and not uh, as your opinion about what we were thinking. So, so with that, I wanted to open it for, for discussion. Is that okay with the finance committee? Is that true to what we agreed on? <laughs> okay. All right. So I, what I'm going to do is really call in each of you just because it, I want to make sure that everybody has a turn. So if you want to raise your hand or if you're okay with me just calling on you, either way, it's okay with me. But I think it's important for all of us to get a reflection on that, if that's okay. Any volunteers to get started? Diane? Oh, oh sorry, Michaela, you're first. I'm looking at the pictures and go ahead. So are we, sorry, Flora, are we giving our reaction or asking yeah. questions or both? A, a little bit of both, but a reaction to 3B will be, will be great and asking the questions within that to start. And then we can move, the idea is that then we can move and say, well, maybe this is not where we need to be. We can go back to, let's say version two of the budget, but that 3B felt by the finance committee responsible and that there was a certain amount of opportunity. I'm, I'm starting to speak for the finance committee. I just want you guys okay. to give your input, okay? And, and 3B is the one with the combined services. Yes, yeah. Okay, um, so I, read this last night and then proceeded to have nightmares <laughs> um, about this process. Um, as a um, person who went to Doty and as a Worcester resident and a Doty mom, um, the concept of Doty students transitioning from Romney to Doty to Romney to U32 feels disruptive. Um, and it also feels like a temporary fix because, um, you know, numbers wise, what works for this year's fifth grade probably isn't going to work for the following years, you know, sixth grade. Um, so I'm not sure this is a sustainable model. Um, I also worry that this is um, a larger conversation to have, and it's an important conversation to have with all the communities in terms of restructuring. But it's a lot to do in a what feels like a rushed manner. Um, as someone pointed out, Doty is, um, at least in some measures, our most vulnerable community. Um, and so it, it feels um, unfair in that sense. Um, and Lastly, I guess getting to the question component, I would be curious to hear um, from Gillian her thoughts on it as principal at Doty. Um, and there was one more thing I was going to say, but what was it? Um, now I don't remember. So I guess um, in terms of the combined services, I have a lot of concerns on this draft. Thank you, Megan. It's... Oh, I know what I was going to say. Okay. Do Doty pre-K is amazing. I'm going to second what everyone else said. Um, and so the idea, I know, Megan, you said it's not like closing a program, but it feels like it's taking this amazing five-star full-time pre-K and putting it somewhere else. Not to say it wouldn't be amazing at Romney, but like if, if Doty is thriving if we're gonna move people just move more people to Doty. <laughs> that's my other thought thank you McKenna and Chris McBay uh, thanks for um thanks for the, the presentation uh but again we have a very um strong outpouring from um our community uh more from um Worcester this time than Middlesex last time. 
uh, but we had a also a strong outpouring from Middlesex. And you know, one of the threads I take from the outpouring is the um, cuts that are being proposed um, are um, for direct service positions that have a significant impact um, on opening opportunities for students, like librarians, um, the coaching, um, and I'm gonna say the Spanish program at Rumney. That is a program cut. There's no other way to say uh, what is being proposed for uh, Spanish at Rumney is anything other than a program cut. Um, I don't see any other pro programmatic cuts um, that are being proposed. Um, but that is a program cut. It's not a staffing cut because it's it's you know specific to the Spanish program. Um, I also heard pretty strongly, um, and I support it, is that we should um, endorse a level funded, a level service budget, and let our communities vote on whether to support that type of budget or not. Uh, the community, it's another method of community voice by having a vote. Uh, and if the community votes it down, then we come back and we have backup plans um, or these backup guidelines for what we want to do. Uh, the other thing that that um, I see here is that you know we're targeting the cuts to direct services uh, for students, and we we talk about um, wanting to provide the best we can for our students, and I understand that there are financial constraints. Um, but if we're talking about reductions, the place it shouldn't happen to me is direct service to students, because that's where um, it matters most to me. Um, I don't see administrative cuts. And if we're having reductions in students at um, the local elementary schools, it would seem that there would be a corresponding reduction in administrative need at those schools. And so combining maybe uh, principalships amongst the elementary schools and maintaining direct student services would be a way to go. I didn't hear anything about cutting athletics. I mean, direct services to students to me, and we're making choices. These cuts represent choices by what we're deciding to include in potential cuts and what we have not even talked about. So, you know, we're making those value choices, even though um, that we haven't discussed them. Uh, so I would support a level service budget. And if our communities reject it, then they reject it and we come back to the drawing board. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Diane? Uh, yeah, you know, basically, um, I, I, I want to be clear too that I don't mean any disrespect to the leadership team and to the um, creative thinking that they've been doing. Um, I just I worry that as some people noted, it's a little bit quick. We really didn't have much turnaround time around this. I think there are some ideas that have been percolating, and so this is us trying to to work through that. Um, historically, I know there was, you know, I was the preschool teacher at Berlin for many years, and I know that at one point there was a, a combined preschool between Doty and Rumney. Um, I think for a variety of reasons that it, it didn't work. Um, and so I think we also identified that um, it used to be within Jen's job that she uh, really organized and kept things up to date. And we as a board voted to put a person into that position. And I think we need to look at that. Similar to what McKaylin's saying, is there a way of encouraging and gathering people to go to choose uh, these quality programs? Um, I, I think we need more time to really clearly identify. Um, and so I support a level funding and I want to be clear that I'm not saying that when we have the hard conversations and we need to start those hard conversations, that it wouldn't necessarily, that we wouldn't get to a point. But right now I'm concerned that um, there hasn't been the opportunity to fully understand and fully flesh it out for the community so that one understands. I also really appreciate the point that uh, preschool and sixth grade are critical transition times. And we already know that there are transitions that will occur. And so to then compound that um, doesn't seem 
uh, to be a, a good idea to me. Um, so I guess, you know, I think there are ways of raising up um, our standards and our, our programming. Uh, and we just, I, I feel we need some more time and um, a wider conversation. I trust our leadership team and I appreciate Kat, your statement about those numbers. I just think though, that it's, it is dramatic changes and we need a bigger conversation. Thank you, Dan. Kari? Thanks, hi, hi everybody. Um, I wanna thank everyone who uh, is here tonight and everyone who spoke a lot of great points. Also wanna thank the leadership team. I thought that was an excellent presentation both in the content and the clarity of the analysis. That's really as clear as I've seen. Um, a few points that are on my mind. Uh, one thing I want to acknowledge right off the bat is these numbers are not as bad as I feared they might be. So um, I think that's just something I want to say. Um, I also think that it was mentioned earlier, but I think one of the most important points in this process to me is in the memo on page four of our packet, there's a very clear statement from the leadership team that they're judging that these reductions that were the ones that were included in version two are appropriate educate, educationally in their uh, professional judgment. That carries a lot of weight with me. Um, the, uh, I think it's point, good to point out that the tax rate um, projection that's built into these, in, into the assumptions of this budget is based on the commissioner's letter. And that includes a, its own assumption of a full use of the state fund reserves. And um, I think we should keep in mind that, that that will be a political process. We don't know how it's gonna turn out. And I'm inclined to be more conservative as a result um, in budgeting um, than, than we might usually be. Um, I also wanna point out, that, you know, it's probably clear to everybody, but in all of these scenarios, we're, we're talking about increases for our taxpayers and across, across the board in all of our towns to some extent. And that this year, everyone is paying more uh, for other expenses in their lives, uh, a lot more in the case of energy and, and food and housing um, and, and, and other expenses. So, um, and, and also that some people in our town, their incomes will grow commensurate with inflation, but it, many will not. And so I think that's important to keep in mind. I have a lot of empathy um, for the comments that were made tonight. I, I think we all want what's best for our students and our district. We would be in such a different situation if our communities were growing, but that's not the situation we're in. And I, I just, I, I need to state that over the long term, um, this year and over the long term, we need to match our spending and our staffing levels to the enrollment. And we're, this year we're looking at a two and a half percent decline in enrollment. It seems to, responsible to me to be reducing um, our staffing um, in, you know, consistent with that. And likely we're gonna be facing similar decisions next year and the year after that and not reducing um, where it's appropriate to do. So this year is really delaying. Um, and, and, um, and potentially even dealing with even more budget pressure next year. Um, and last thing I wanna say is that the trends dictate, I think that combined services are, are coming for us. Uh, and we're gonna be looking at those kinds of changes in the, in the near future. Um, one example, uh, I, I don't think that, um, I, I think that we will be considering is having all sixth graders go to U32. Um, I, I just, I think that's not an unreasonable thing to, to, to think about. Um, so I think what, you know, if we can think of this as an opportunity in some sense, we should view next year as an, as an opportunity to, to, to try some combined programs on a, on a limited basis and see what we can learn from them. And so that's, that's why I'm, I'm favoring 3B. Thank you. Thank you, Kari. Natasha? Uh, good evening. First of all, I just want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. It's great to see so many people participating, especially from the town of Worcester. I was very excited to see um, so much participation. And I'm, I'm just looking down at my notes to make sure I cover everything I want to say. Um, so I want to start out by saying that 
the only year that my son attended at Doty was sixth grade. And that was a huge year for him to be able to transition from another school system into our school system and establish friendships moving into U32. And I can honestly say that his sixth grade year at Doty is probably the best elementary experience he had in the three different schools that he has been in between Baltimore, Northfield and Washington Central. Um, and so I would, I would hate to see other sixth graders not be able to have that same sort of experience that he had. And that came from the teacher he had, it came from the, the group of students that he was with and it came from the leadership and um, the compassion and love that Gillian showed to him as a new student or building. Um, so I would, I would hate to see sixth grade move out, out of Worcester. I also just wanna echo some of the thoughts that I think that we do have to be responsible and think about some creative solutions to this, um, but I think it does need to be a bigger conversation. And I appreciate the community members who said that they, they would like to have um, more opportunity to participate in this conversation and not just in a couple meetings <laughs> leading up to the vote. Um, so I understand we're gonna have to make tough decisions, whether it's this year or next year or the year after. But I think that if we're gonna be talking about restructuring how our schools look, that needs to be a, a, a bigger conversation and a conversation that our community members can be a part of. And pushing that further out, I think is gonna enable us to have more of, of that kind of um, participation from the community. Thank you. Hey, Joshua. Hi, everyone. Uh, I just want to say thanks for everyone who showed up, the leadership team. Um, I just want to say right off the bat that I do support uh, option 3B. I think that um, to go ahead with level funding is just, as some others have pointed out, it doesn't seem very responsible given the decline in, in, given the decline in enrollment. Um, I support combined services. Um, I did not know that Doty had such a reputable um, pre-K program. And one of my questions that I think was raised by a fellow board member is um, why, why combine, why go to Rumney and why not students from Middlesex go to uh, Doty? Um, that's one question. I'm not saying they should do that. It's just a question that comes to mind. And um, the the combining or or having sixth graders from Doty go to one go for one year to um, Rumney seems a bit clunky to me. But um, overall, uh, like I do, I do support three B, even if that is still part of it. I just um, I wonder if that needs to be part of it. That's my only, uh, that's my only comment on that. Um, anyway, thank you everybody. Thank you so much, Joshua. I think if, uh, Daniel, if you would allow me, uh, Megan, I'm wondering if uh, if you could speak a little bit of the preschool program. I, 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 at least I have an urge to say, like my kids went to preschool in East Montpelier and it was a great program, actually. My kids moved out of the four corner school and I didn't want that to happen. And I, you know, I had to learn about that. So could we just explain a little bit, do we have a good preschool program in every school? Yeah, thanks, Flora. Um, I think, you know, one of the advantages to being a system that um, collaborates across the system is that we do have very high quality pre-K programs in all of our schools. And we would rely on that quality and expertise to design a single program to serve two communities. And that's really what it is, which is a different thing than just closing one and putting kids in another one. It is very much designing what is needed for those two communities. Yes, it would be at one site instead of two and there's changes associated with that. And we're not naive to those at all, um, but all of our programs are very high quality, um, led very well uh, by a team of people. And um, so that is what that would look like. Um, is really a design of a program to serve two communities, building on the successes that we already have. Thank you. Daniel? 
Oh, I'm I'm sorry. Can I, I I did not mean to infer that the that the Romney oh, no, I, I, program. I, no, no, I, I, no, no, I get it, Joshua. But we we had some uh, right, members right. that had I, I just question. Think that you, it's, no, no. Yeah. If if totally. it's five days already, that's amazing. That's one of the reasons why I don't yeah. send my child to Romney is because it's not it doesn't support working parents already. So th that's all. I did not mean to. You know, I, I told it was not because of you. I just wanted to clarify yeah. that we have good programs in every right. and elementary school. I totally, I would, yeah. I'm in. yeah. Okay, yeah. And the hope is that it will help working parents like you. Okay, uh, Daniel. Thanks. Um, yeah, I just wanted to acknowledge all, all of what everyone said. I also want to acknowledge a lot of written comments that we've received by email as a board from people who maybe couldn't make it here. Um, also the questions from Dodie that McKaylin shared. Uh, we, we've we've all had a chance to, well, we've received them. I had a chance to look at them while I was listening to some people speak earlier. Um, and also I wanna acknowledge the fact that there's a lot of people out there who also don't oppose um, funding our schools adequately, but also who are very afraid of the rising costs in their own household budgets. Um, I'm leaning towards supporting uh, a level service budget or whatever is closest to that offered. Um, I'm interested in knowing what the process would be if voters choose to vote that down, um, what the costs are of that, both the financial costs to the district in uh, having to pull together an alternative um, in an unconventional time of year, and also the the political and social costs of the community, which I, I acknowledge people maybe can't quantify as easily. Um, I really appreciated a lot of what Kari pointed out. We're, we're in sort of a, a, a bleak period, funding-wise and budget-wise, and socioeconomically and demographically here. Um, the increase in property taxes is big, I'm facing a significant increase in pro property taxes under the best case scenario here. And I agree with Kari, and I think it's worth repeating what Kari said that the 63 million offered or currently in the education fund as a surplus is almost certainly not all gonna be available to us. So those projected tax rates are gonna be higher than, than what were listed. Um, so we should go in with our, our eyes open. I also, not to be snarky or snide, appreciate the attendance here. I hope everyone else who's here and even more um, show up for conversations about restructuring. Um, so I'm not gonna oppose, I mean, I'm, I am gonna oppose restructuring sort of in this quick, uh, what feels to me like a quick way this year, um, but restructuring of some kind has to happen. It doesn't necessarily have to be a negative thing. I think there's a lot of opportunity, like what Megan was saying. Um, I acknowledge the opportunity that um, the consolidation of the pre-K might offer, but I wanna see possibly, you know, across the entire district, uh, five days a week, full day pre-K as a possibility in restructuring. Yes, it might require some consolidation, but imagine that, imagine, um, a lot of other opportunities, world language exposure for all elementary schools. Um, there could be some amazing things to come out of restructuring, but we all have to bring uh, sort of our full hearts to that. So I hope we all do. Thank you, Daniel. I'm gonna try to pull two questions and maybe Megan can help us answer that. That would inform the, the board members. So so first question, man, would be, uh, what would it mean if the budget got voted down? What does it really mean for the people doing the work? And then the second one that I think we didn't do enough today, maybe, and we haven't done it in a little while, is could you talk a little bit about the sunsetting of the ESSER funds, sort of trying to combine those two, if you're okay with that? That would be great. Yep, thanks. Um, I'll start with the budget voting down. Um, there's a couple of really immediate things that happen. Um, and the first one is um, it is really difficult after the typical budget season to turn around with an effective timeline uh, because new budget would then have to be warned with the right amount of time forward. And so it 
I mean, we think this process felt rushed. It would be much more rushed. Now, it is true. We've already talked a lot about reductions. And so if the board were just going to then take those reductions, um, but it's never quite that simple. So it's an incredibly compressed timeline. The other thing though, that um, that's a reality that that is real, but perhaps we could adjust to it. The second piece is much different and more difficult. And that is because because of the time frame that we would need as a system to notify potential teachers of potential reductions, if we don't know what those reductions are, because we aren't sure if the budget will pass, and there's a risk of um, cutting positions after the, we would have to notify people of a potential reduction in force early and we would potentially be notifying more people because we would have to cast a wider net because otherwise we would find ourselves in a position where we haven't met those notifications and then we're unable to make the cuts regardless of the budget situation. That has a couple of impacts. One, it has a psychological and emotional impact. It already does, it already has, even in these hypothetical conceptual conversations. But the second piece is it also causes teachers to look around and in Vermont right now, there are jobs available because there aren't enough, we, we know that, we experience that. So we we risk losing quality people. Um, so budgets go down, school districts figure that out, but I think from a strategy standpoint, wait and see is really risky. Uh, and then the ESSER piece, sorry, Flora, I forgot you had two questions. Um, so we talk about ESSER money a lot, um, it is a significant amount of money paying for a significant number of FTE in this current budget, and it goes away next year, one fell swoop. That means that we start next year's budget right out of the gate, regardless of tax rate or anything like that in the hole, so to speak. We know that, we've known it ever, we've known it since we put those positions in place, um, but that's another reality that we will have to face that I sometimes wonder if we really understand what that means. It's like our budget will automatically, our level service budget next year will automatically go up um, by a large number. And that won't even count factoring in teacher increases and, and um, all the other things that caused our first budget to go up. So a lot, that's when we say things like that's just delaying the inevitable. Um, that's kind of what we, we mean. That That is a significant um, cliff that we will have to adjust to. And, and that includes if we are having conversations about keeping those positions. Um, so the positions either are gone or we find another funding source for them. But again, that's, that's um, that piece. So I know that's been said before, um, but I think sometimes we lose sight of the magnitude of that. Suzanne, I hate putting my team on the spot. Do you have a uh, off the top of your head number for what that will be? Uh, our best, sir. Mm, I could get it for you. Give me just a minute. Okay, That's this great. is yeah. what I mean, but I wouldn't normally do that. But we're not talking about fifty thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars. We're talking about multiple hundreds. Of Uh, right now, our Besser is supporting $575,000. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, Eric and then Maggie. Thank you. Um, I want to thank uh, the uh, administration for the presentation at the beginning um, and all the information that you gave. And I also want to thank the community for all of the input that you've given tonight. Um, you know, it's definitely made me uh, stop and think a little more about uh, my position on the budget and what all is going on and, and, you know, what is important to folks. And I am leaning more towards the level funded budget. You know, I know there are parts of the other budgets that, you know, may not be as bad to cut if there are positions that are currently not filled or not needed um, that could be cut out without any impact. But I really do see from both my own perspective and the communities, the importance of some of these other 
um, programs and positions being cut. And uh, I really want to thank everybody for their, their well thought out comments tonight um, in regards to that. So, um, so overall, I was looking at 3B, but I am more seriously leaning towards a level funded budget at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Maggie? Uh, reiterating what everyone else has said, thanks to the administration for the two budget models um, and making the information accessible and um, palatable for those of us who don't live in the financial world in particular. Um, and also for all the time that's been provided um, to answer questions as we've gone along tonight, I think has been helpful to hear directly from administration rather than waiting until the end. Um, so thank you, Flora, for facilitating that and for all the responses from Megan um, and Suzanne in particular. Um, the first thing I wanted to comment on is the enrollment projection accuracy as a community member, as a parent of children who attended um, Callis Elementary School, one since pre-K, and um, children who went through U32, one still there. And my alarm when I was presented by that information in disbelief um, over a decade ago by a prior superintendent. Um, I didn't want to believe it. And here we are um, experiencing it now. And um, I want to reiterate my query from a prior recent meeting. How can we prioritize engaging with the planning commissions and development review boards in our communities to support development? There is no housing for sale. They, we can have all the high speed internet we want. There's nowhere for people to live and the affordability factor is real. <clears throat> so that to me, we need to be looking not just at the school, but the larger community and how we can facilitate people moving here. Um, I agree, this is a great place to live, um, equally attracted for the educational opportunities for my kids to grow up in, having come from Massachusetts schools, which are considered to be some of the best in the country. Um, but I wanted my kids to have community. And this is something that we do afford with our small schools. So strong proponent for small schools here, um, but I agree that we need to do some major planning that's far beyond the schools themselves. Um, with regards to the budget, the community members that came out today collectively expressed a desire for level service budget and some recommended an increase to enhance educa educational opportunities for youth today. While I now work as an educator in a neighboring school district, I spent eight years as a home health care provider, home visiting in households across the county. And I want to acknowledge that there are other community voices that we're not hearing from who are struggling to afford property taxes, experience transportation challenges, experience food insecurity, and challenges affording health care like basic medications. Um, that said, Ballots by mail offer everyone an opportunity to make their voices heard on the coming budget. Um, but I just want to acknowledge we are not hearing from the entire community here. We're hearing from the folks who are most immediately affected. Um, and those other voices are valid and need to be um, brought to the table. Um, I do support 3A with a commitment to the visioning process. I have um, concerns about morale in what is an, an exceptional school district and experiencing um, school board um, resistance to supporting administration's um, budgeting goals in my own school district. I, I'm seeing firsthand how it affects my coworkers um, and that insecurity um, in the same way that Megan is saying, not knowing what the future holds if the budget was voted down creates insecurity, but we know our communities. I think if you look back at the history of, of budget approval, we are overwhelmingly communities that prioritize education. Um, so I, I, my hunch is that we have some security in that right now, but when we talk about future years with the loss of the ESSER funding um, and perhaps for some of the families that are participating today, that is 
the, the budgetary climate in which they have been raising their children in our school district. So they don't know what it was like before. Um, I also want to say that I 110% believe in the importance of having school nurses in all of the schools as a former school district employee. I have um, seen the impact not having full-time nursing in a school when there were students who really needed access to that full-time. Um, and I'm also the child of a librarian. So I, I understand that that's equally important. So for all those reasons, I'm, I'm sticking with 3A and trusting the community to um, make that determination collectively in much larger numbers than what we're seeing tonight. Thank you, Maggie. Uh, Lindy? I moved and then I couldn't find my mute button. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I've listened to a lot of this and I returned to the population numbers and student numbers. I've done it for years from before I was on the bigger board and at the school board, because sometimes as we get smaller, well, not sometimes, always, the per student cost goes up because it's very hard if we still need to have a first grade, a second grade, a third grade, whatever, um, but we don't have as many kids. and. Uh, so that is my big concern, and I had, I want to keep reiterating how small our schools are getting, how they are so small. When I was working at East Montpelier, the pre-K was moved to the Four Corners School. It had been in the building, but our numbers were almost 300 kids, and that tells you how much our numbers have changed in 20 years, um, more than 20 years. So they moved the pre-K to the Four Corner School, which people weren't very thrilled with, but it turned out to be a pretty nice place for the students, but they weren't in the bigger school with all the kids. Uh, I, I think the idea of that sixth grade was, I, I just don't even, I, I don't get that one, but um, moving all sixth graders to a building somewhere in the future when we have a plan, I understand. But I don't understand when I worked in the district and I was in all the schools, the Dodie banners with the eight kids <laughs> that were the sixth grade class, they have them all over their gym. They had their names, they had their year. Those kids had gone through and then they get into the big U32 and just, I'm sure like my own children, they become friends with the person who lives the farthest in the district. Like my child, it was Riverton, I think was his friend and it was so far to drive, but they, it's such a great transition from the small school into the U32 school. Um, so we have great schools. I've been in all of them. I've worked in all of them. They all have their own taste, but voting a budget down, I've been in a district where the budget was voted down a few times. And as a staff member, it's very disheartening you don't feel the community believes in you. You don't feel the board believes in you. You don't feel anybody does. Uh, and the time frame on the administration to get all those budgets reworked, and then a full town clerk having to run—it's—it's it's, a, it's, it's not fun. So that scares me as well. I would like to say I appreciate some of the creative creativity. Um, one of which was the principal teacher model that Kat talked about. And that was something that Vermont was kind of known for in our small schools, a principal who taught reading or a principal who was also, well, Stephen this year, a math teacher. Um, those looking outside the box of I'm this person and that's all I can do. We might be able to see ways to keep some of these positions that are being cut back used in a different way as our population goes down. Because what I was assured of in our last time was these were not going to affect programming as far as if music was cut by point something, the kids would all still be getting their music lessons and their, but there were fewer students and fewer sessions needed. So um, that was important to me. I'm really having trouble with what I believe because I think we don't have the number of students and we don't I'm I'm worried about the amount of money. So I'm I'm having a little trouble saying whether I'm for the level or for the B. I am not for some of the changes in where kids go to school because I don't think we've 
spent the time that we need for any kind of reorganization. That should start this spring, have all kinds of input and have a lot of different options and table moving around for a community where we can write on paper or do whatever and talk about. Um, so that part I'm, I'm not in favor of. I guess I'm, I just think we have to keep in mind our population and that we don't have as many kids in the schools. Um, and how can we be creative to meet the needs of the students? Because we do have some great schools. Thank you, Lindy. Ursula? So Lindy just talked about our decreasing number of students and the fact that our schools are small and they're going to be getting smaller. And we as a board, it's our job to be fiscally responsible to our whole community. And we've had a large outpouring tonight, but it is not everybody. It's not representative of everybody. And Kari said it at the beginning, but I'm going to repeat it. Inflation has gone up and people are paying more for food, medicine, doctor's visit, everything across the board. And now taxes are gonna go up even with our cuts. And I would be concerned that we are going to increase our budget, increase our taxes to a point where people are going to be turned away from our towns. They would not be able to consider coming to our community because they can't afford to. And so that does not bring families into our communities. And so it returns me to that fiscally responsible um, portion and it's why I support 3B. And I support those structural changes knowing that they are going to be hard for the communities. We heard from everybody talking with so much passion and excitement and love for their local pre-K and their sixth grade and the traditions that they have. And I'm here to say that we didn't hear from everybody, but every one of our towns has those like amazing traditions and amazing pre-K programs. And I think that we will create something new, but you know, Flora said it at the beginning about looking at it with a growth mindset and it's hard to change, but let's see what we can do with it. And it can be a pilot program to look at how we can make structural changes for the future that our district is gonna need to succeed. Thank you, Ursula. Uh, Jonas. Um, there's very, very little that I could say that uh, that everybody else hasn't said. Um, I support 3A or something like it. It's We need to make sure that we understand that's a close to a level service budget, not a level funding budget. Level funding budget would be much, much less money. Um, I don't think it's fair to Worcester and to Doty to put these changes in, as a bunch of people have said, without uh, a lot of consultation. This is, and it's also, you know, it feels like a Band-Aid, right? Um, there are, we need to address the structural issues. We need to address the enrollment issues, but that needs to be part of a very, very intentional process. I don't think it's fair to have to do that in, ter you know, in, in the context of, uh, you know, a budget year where we're under the gun. Um, what else can I say? Um, um, you know, I think that we should be approaching it, you know, in, 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 we should be approaching this with, you know, without a scarcity mindset, you know, I think we should have an abundance mindset. Um, I also think it's really important to distinguish between the cuts in FTEs that are an inevitable result of declining enrollment and cuts in FTEs that we uh, um, that are that are purely intended for budgetary reasons. Um, I think you know certainly support the first where where necessary, not the second. Um, right now, I agree with what Chris said. I mean, we should put it to the vote. You know, put it to the voters. I think that that's how you know we that's how we hear the voices of most of the community. Um, you know. Let's put it to a vote. Um, I also echo uh, what I, I think Daniel said about hoping to hear this level of input from the community when we do go through that process, um, right? Because we can't do this without the community. 
I think we're seeing, you know, why tonight. Um, yeah, I, I think that's that's all I have to say um, because so much has been said already. Okay, yeah. thank you, everybody. I have, oh, Joshua, do you want a last comment? I want to comment too. Go ahead, go ahead. But I, 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 I just, I just really quickly want to like just reiterate and point out what uh, Megan said. Um, if we think this process is rushed now, what happened? Like when it gets voted down, that's even worse. And with the sunsetting of ESSER funds next year, I mean, that's going to be, a, that's going to seem so, so, so drastic. Um, and that's going to feel like we're under the gun. I don't think we're ever going to probably get to a place where we feel like, oh, like we're not under the gun. We can feel comfortable making the hard decisions that need to be made um, for the for the education that we all deserve. That's all. Thank you, Joshua. So I, I have some of my own comments taking off my sort of board chair for 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 a minute, just if you guys would allow me. I, I, I think that, you know, I. I think that we've been at this for, for a long time as communities. We have had strong schools in our district for a really long, long time, not just this three years. We had had, if I'm gonna pull this out, this efficiency study from 2014, 2015, that you know the executive committee pulled together, a Michael DeWeese, who was who helped us interview Megan, put together for us that outlined a lot of um, uh, opportunities that we that we had together. And what I want to say is that I think yes, uh, the sixth grade and the and the pre-K might feel might feel rushed, but but I think we have the best people to rush that with. You know, we have the best team to work to what is best for our students and make those a pilot program. You know, I, that that is a way to see, oh, it might work or it might not work while we are having the strategic planning uh, conversations with our community, which we're about to engage of what, what we value as a community. We, we hear a lot about Spanish, we hear a lot about art, and that would allow us to prioritize that as a, as a district together. I feel, I feel strongly that we will delay the pain, the cliff will just be wider and and and, and just taller next year, right? I, I know it's hard I, I hear the community I, I've been in this position many times and you know it, it breaks my heart there's so many things that I would like to keep to but but if I really think about what is best for kids if I go back to that sentence that Kari I try to say it at the beginning too that we're going to preserve strong programs for our kids we are not giving less to our kids we're doing what is best with the resources that we have is my understanding from the information that I'm getting so, so we're not, it's not that we're taking out of Peter to give to Paul either, because that's not why we do that. The leadership team and our entire district works together to collaborate, to, to give to each other, to learn from each other. So as a board, sometimes we, we do have to take risks. We do have to lead. That's part of why people elect us too. And, and I want to re reiterate that not everybody, you know, as a BIPOC person, and I know we have another member in our board, I, no, and our diversity in the Washington Central area is is more in economics. It's not really we don't have a real big diversity, and we have they are not at the table with us today, right? We don't have everybody at the table, and three different people have said it, and and we all, especially us at this table, including the community members, have the responsibility to put that hat on tonight when we're giving comments. And I know that all of the board members care, all of the board members understand that and want what is best for kids. So that was my last attempt to try to beg for 3B. But it's, I have heard from board members and I wrote, two of you didn't say one way or another, but from what I've heard, I, I'm thinking that maybe what we wanna do is go back to budget draft two, what was presented at the last time as a middle point, right? As, as, a, as a way to maybe we don't take the pre-K and the six changes, but we take all of the other changes. And uh, Megan, I wonder if we might have that slide that we could bring it up. I see two board members have a question, but if you would allow me to just refresh everybody's memory on what that is, is that okay? Okay. I'll put it up right now, Laura. Thank you.
and uh, how are you doing? <laughs> We've been sitting for a while and I have time to give everybody a break too. But after this, we'll, we'll get a little break and then come back and deliberate. And I know it's getting late. Okay, thank you. And I'll put my portrait hat again and behave myself here. Okay. Thank you. And I will just acknowledge that this is now not formatted the same way as what you just saw. Um, because it's last, it's last month's slide just moved over. Um, and, and actually I could show it to you on the other slide that does have the explanation, but these are the reductions that were proposed before. And I would also remind the board that um, this draft too included the ad of health education, um, which uh, was not represented in the 7% budget. Uh, recommendation. So there is an ad here um, in order to be able to deliver that service. So these are the original cuts. Um, forgive that the explanation are on the other slide. The other thing that we can show up, because I saw Suzanne um, looking at it, I can show you the tax implications of draft two, if that is also helpful. Um, so let me do that. Sorry for the switching. I Will this that... include the CLA changes? Because when we had draft two, we didn't know the CLA changes. That's what I am showing you. And I see Suzanne on it. Suzanne, if I share slide 25, is that? If you share slide 25, that is um, draft 3B less the preschool and sixth grade uh, conversion. So it's not necessarily draft two. It's our 3B with without doing the pre-K and sixth grade moves. Great. And it's Which with the updated CLAs. Perfect. Thank you for that. So this, it says 3B, but this, this is the 3B recommendation, which is the reductions except for the two restructuring. And this is the tax rate implications. Thank you, Megan. It, Suzanne, do you, you by any chance uh, have the per 100K? Um, yeah, it's $71 for Berlin, mm -hmm. uh, 64 for Callis, 44 for East Montpelier, 68 for Middlesex, and six for Worcester on 100,000. I didn't do it all the way out. Didn't quite have No, that's that. okay. Yeah. Thank you. Is that helpful for board members? Did you get that? Do you need to repeat it or you got it? Okay. Is there a possibility of doing a split screen of the two slides so that we can see it visually? The 3B versus with Zoom. Come on, we can do this. <laughs> two it's slides. more that I don't have them on a document together. Yeah. Um, the let me think you about that. You can't split screen a Zoom. I'm questioning that. No, so it, I'm not saying I know maybe, how to, but I'm assuming yeah, there's a way to, yeah. to show two different screens at the same time. But let's let's work some logistics while it, let's have a five minute break and maybe work out some logistics. Then we'll come back and have Diane, Maggie, and then you ask questions, and then we'll do some less deliberation. Is that okay? Just a five minute break so everybody can have tea or a nature break. Okay. It will be back 20, 40, uh, 8.45. Welcome. It's so nice to see the students with us. Floor, Steven, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Sorry. Which, I know you want to see the 3B without, sorry, you can't see me. So uh, you didn't see my thinking face. Um, I know you want to see the 3B without the restructuring what's the other slide do you want to see the the level the new the 9.7 or the seven what's the other slide you want to see i was thinking the seven unless the board feels uh, differently the the nine the okay the level service i'm here i'm seeing some faces so the level services and the and the 3b without pre-k and without the sixth grade okay keep talking but I think yeah, I while, you, while you do that, and Stephen, I was just saying, 
I hear you made it to the Career Center. Thank you for going. I'm so jealous. I couldn't make it. But thank you for going. Yeah, it, it was good. Thanks uh, for supporting us. You had some representation there from the other board. <laughs> Great. Anything you have to share while we wait <laughs> about that meeting, you can share with everybody. Um, I, so to the other board members in the community, um, there is a listening session going on right now um, in the state uh, about uh, CTE education and governance and how we fund it and all of that. And so there is a consultant group that is uh, listening in on uh, these conversations where they're asking questions about how we could improve, what are some of the roadblocks. And so I went over to the community forum today for that group and um, there were uh, several people there that spoke about first the positive nature of uh, career and technical education. It's so important to our state and to our community. Um, and then just some of the roadblocks that exist, you know, funding is always tricky for CTE. Um, schedules are tricky for it. Um, what, uh, what length of day um, the programs run because they're both half day and full day and full day can mean a lot of different things depending on where you are. So it was a very good conversation. Um, I think that they gathered quite a bit of information and they said that they're still continuing to gather more. And I think the thing to remember is that the state is going to be making some decisions about our CTE system in the state in the coming months about how they want it organized and governed um, long-term and, and funded as well, which will play back into some of our conversations that we're having today as well. Thank you so much, Stephen, that was great. Did I buy you enough time, Megan? <laughs> Almost, not quite. Okay, I'm gonna let Diane and Maggie, uh, Maggie, sorry, Michaelin, and I keep changing your name. Okay, and then Chris, I haven't forgotten you. Go Diane, and we still have another part of the packet, right? So that everybody remembers. Yes. Okay, um, you know, so I, I just, I felt compelled to just respond that you're, to me, the biggest disservice that we would do to all of this work that has happened is if we don't have the conversations beyond this point of what we look like as a district that, you know, we often have had these hard conversations right at budget time, budget we resolve it, and then we don't pick it up again. And so to me, that's where the huge disservice is, that if we don't start these hard conversations right away and begin it, and I know we're doing strategic planning, but we need to remember all of these things that we've been bringing up and all of the voices that we know are missing. I mean, I'm a Berlin rep here. I'm the one, I am one of a community that's gonna be greatly impacted by this. And I get it. I worked with these families, I know, and I respect that. But I also am very concerned that we're shutting down a lot um, without having greater input into it. So I just, I felt compelled to say that I just hope we don't drop this ball, regardless of where we go with this budget vote, that we do not drop the ball because we do have to have these hard conversations, but we need to have them with opportunities in a wider range. Thank you, Diane. Michaela. Um, thank you. Yes to everything Diane just said. Also, I had a I had asked a question that didn't get answered, so I was hoping to ask it again. And and before I do, um, in in future conversations like this, it would be super helpful. And maybe this exists somewhere. And if so, Laura, you can email me. But to know what programs exist in which schools. Um, because I think there's some misconception maybe about what's available in each of the schools. Okay, but my question um, is in light of the restruct restructuring question, if I could hear, if we could hear from Gillian as to her thoughts as principal at Doty um, about the possibilities suggested tonight. Um, Yes, thank you. Uh, so what has happened in the budget process is we're looking at the reality of declining school uh, declining student enrollment across the district. And the board asked for some creative solutions. And so there was a lot of brainstorming done and ideas that were thrown out. Um, and these were two of them. They are not ideas that we've really fully 
fleshed out exactly what it would look like. And I appreciate the board's comments because what I would want to be clear about is that um, I, at this point, don't consider them well thought out enough to be a pilot program or something that could be replicated, particularly, for example, with the sixth grade option that wouldn't work in the following school year because the fifth grade, the, uh, the current fourth grades at Doty and Rumney would be too large to allow that to happen. Um, and so um, this has been a real struggle because any of you guys who read my annual reports or my, my digests know that I have a real love affair with Doty and Wolster. Um, you know, and that heart is right out there on, on my sleeve. And yet I also look at the um, numbers and um, in, the, in the spirit of frankness, I, I agree with Floor in that the cliff is only getting taller. And I agree that not all voices are present at the table right now. And that, um, that it would be a, making the shifts, the proposed shifts this year would be a Band-Aid, um, you know, just to spin a little bit. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could, instead of just looking at what we're doing with pre-K in two of our schools, if we looked in pre-K across the entire district, um, Kim Bolduck and I spent a summer sweating about whether or not the Doty five-day combination of pre-K and community connections would work and it and it did work. And so we have a model that we know we can do and how do we look really thoughtfully and planfully about how do we make it work across the district rather than with just five schools so that we can um, have have maximal access to a limited resource, which is childcare for three and four year olds in this state. And I just wanna be really upfront that the shifting the sixth grade option, um, that would, that's not a, combining Rumney and Doty fifth and sixth graders might work this year, but it wouldn't necessarily work down the road. And um, I support the, the board ideas of getting more voices around the table. And so that's really sort of the thinking about it. And, and the proposals are really about absent strategic planning. This is what we could do. And the word was used clunky and it is clunky, absent strategic planning. I hope that answered it because I got a little rambly because it is kind of late. Hey. Thank you, Gillian. And I, I just wanted to remind, uh, especially community members that haven't been uh, to all of our board meetings that we put a request for proposal out. Uh, we're about to engage in a consultant to help us with community engagement as we, that is one of the four goals, right? To get better at community engagement and tie that process to uh, strategic planning to help us exactly uh, do our year round budgeting. Uh, so I just wanted to tie that, that in there. Uh, Megan, I'm going to give it back to you just to, I see your hand, Chris, but I want to do what we asked Megan to do so that I can take the share and I and we can see everybody. Go ahead. Um, well, I think that I have the two things up that you, that you want to look at. On the left-hand side is the slide from earlier tonight around the um, it's not really level service, right? Because that's level service doesn't exist in the same way, but this is the 9.7. This is the higher of the two that you've seen. And this on the right is the, sorry, Floyd, you asked for the other one, didn't you? I'll flip it in a second. But the one on the right is um, your draft two without the restructuring. The draft, 3B without the restructuring, right? Restructuring, right? That's what's on the right. On the right, okay. So this is actually the difference between the highest and the um, the middle ground that you're just representing. Okay. 
Is, is that helpful for board members? Can you see it? Okay. Let's hold that is that for a minute or if you guys need to take a screenshot and then let's just uh, take the, the share for a minute of my, it's just really hard to see everybody. Uh, Chris, and then I'll speak to the comparison. Go ahead, Chris. Um, I just had an informational question on the ESSER uh, funds that, that's been uh, talked about quite a bit tonight and the positions that are related to it. Um, I think my my understanding or at least impression was that um, those funds were being used to hire for staff members um, due to the increased need based on the pandemic and that they were never intended to be permanent positions. Um, is that accurate or not accurate? Well, I'm going to ask the answer it's that conceptually. Way your time, Megan. And then I, well, right. I but conceptually, yes, that is what ARP ESSER funds were. They were the third phase of funding designed to help schools respond long term to the pandemic. So they were designed to be used to infuse systems with what they need according to their plan and all of that. Um, and they were always intended to be one-time funds. Um, in terms of the genesis of how we are using them, I may, Jen, I don't know if you would add anything to that for that half of the question. Yeah, I think I could just add that all of that, um, our moving forward plan or recovery plan had come from the comprehensive needs assessment that we had engaged in uh, when those funds were first available and have continued to build on those around um, social emotional well-being and health for our students, academic recovery, engagement, we, that was uh, less of an issue for us because of the ways that we operated our schools. We didn't have a lot of truancy issues uh, like other school systems. But all of that, those decisions had come from the needs assessment that we had done initially. Um, and that's exactly exactly what Megan said is conceptually, they are designed to um, help us go through the pandemic and then recover in the areas that our school system needs to recover in. So has the use of the funds um, uh, been transformed from that goal and that uh, that goal to a different goal? Well, I would I would answer it this way. They are used right now to pay for staff, or at least the five hundred and seventy five yeah, that Suzanne shared. Yeah, yeah, they that's used to pay for staffing, and yes that staffing is there carrying out the plan that Washington Central developed. Um, the challenge with it was the intention for those positions to go away. Um, the money goes away. So the district, the, the answer is yes. Um, but many districts, once you have positions, people begin to like those positions and rely on those positions. And so it is not as easy as it sounds to say, um, but that is one answer to the cliff, Chris, is that the money goes away, the positions go away. Right, okay. I'm, so I'm, I'm, I would be assuming that the need has diminished as the pandemic has faded. If that's not accurate, we should hear that. Um, but my needs as much, that would be good to know too. <clears throat> I would say that, well, to, it related to answering that question, what I would say is we, we continue to serve a, a very needy population. Most school districts who have added positions in the areas of counseling and nursing, which is what we did, uh, among other things, is that the, that the schools would then lean into a design of what we do need moving forward. And if we did need some of those positions to remain, we would have a thoughtful plan with which to do that. And then that thoughtful plan would have to include how to pay for it once the money goes away. Right. So um, that is the work that most schools uh, have to engage in. And that's a different way of answering the question of, of neediness. It's more about what do we need, how do we need to be structured to be able to be ready when that money goes away? Okay, thank you. Michaela? I, I can't resist saying as the family physician that the, the, the needs 
have not gone away, that the pandemic, I think, was a lot more traumatic than, you know, initially thought and has, has these ripple effects that hopefully won't last forever, but with this cohort of students still exist. Um, so I think that needs to go into, you know, hopefully our larger discussion um, down the line as to how to support these really critical services for our, you know, the well-being of our students. I think we might have lost her. She, her internet has been unstable. Uh, Maggie, and, and then I want to bring, bring us back because, Maggie, go ahead. Yeah, I'm probably going to be a little broad brushed here too and just add that, you know, it's not just us that's being affected in the educational sector. This is happening in the entire economy. There are still housing needs. People are no longer getting housing assistance that was being provided. People were getting additional fuel assistance that are no longer getting fuel assistance. So the, there are <clears throat> so many different sectors and, and different aspects of basic needs that are being affected by these funds being um, ending. And you know, it, the whole point during COVID was for us to be having a larger conversation about what is our vision. And that's something that's come up a lot tonight is what, you know, what is our optimal educational environment? How do we, you know, serve the needs of our kids and, and how do we prioritize education and how much money are we willing to to put towards that. <clears throat> I don't quite understand what's happening. She just disappeared too and might disappear. I don't know what's going on. Kari? She's still there. I'm gonna try to bring us back. Oh, Maggie, there you are. You were done, Maggie? I see you. <laughs> okay. Maybe we will finish, I think, Maggie. Um, so uh, I just want to talk about our process uh, a little bit because it's late and um, there's, uh, there's so much more to talk about. But uh, Floor, what, what is your goal for tonight? What do you want from the board? So I, I would like to get some clarity for our leadership team. And I also would like to encourage us to give an inclination one way or another. I know we have told the community that we would approve a budget on the 18th we do our next item is to approve the announced tuition so we gotta do that too so we we have to know more or less what their range would be in order to approve the tuition you guys read the memo uh, on time so with that i oh go ahead Kari. Here's a suggestion. Um, what if we ask that um, everybody think over the next week about 3a and what we might call 3C, the new one that we saw uh, tonight that is the version of 3B without the restructuring, that those be um, on our minds over the next week. Any questions that come up, maybe we can create a shared document. And I hate to burden Megan and the team anymore, but maybe we can get those answered by, you know, a date certain before the meeting. And then everybody come on Wednesday next week and we'll go around and people will say, what they're what they're leaning towards and and uh, one or two or three reasons why so we each get to hear from each other and then we vote because the questions the discussion could go on throughout next week's meeting as well and we'll, and we'll have other business and okay. and one more point floor to you you're looking for an inclination yeah i the, wanted to do it show I would, the rest, or... we, we can we may want to just be conservative and choose the more conservative figure tonight if we have to make a decision. I'd rather make a, a conservative decision about that and stay open-minded about what happens next week if we can, if that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, and with that, uh, Jonas, I see your hand up. I was gonna, before we, so we'll transition into talking about tuition after Jonas's question. Uh, I, I still feel that we haven't done clarity. Uh, oh, Megan, go first, and then I'll get to Josh, to Josh, to Jonah. Sorry, everybody. Go ahead. Megan. Sorry, I don't mean to speak over Jonas. I just want to make sure that I, at the end, before you go to the next agenda item, can just make sure I understand. And then I do want to put some due dates around when we would need to get the questions in order to be able to answer you. That's all. So Jonas, you go first, but just. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah I just I, I remembered one thing that I wanted to say earlier, and and that is that even three A does not exceed the excess spending threshold, right? We are we're not. I I don't think that three A. I don't think a level service budget is uh, is irresponsible, um, and there are you know there are. There are, you know, Vermont has systems for the mitigation, you know, for tax mitigation, you know, and income sensitivity. You know, there are there are mechanisms there. Uh, I understand that, you know, tax rates have a ripple effect across the economy, particularly on renters. Right. I don't you know, that's 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 not lost. Um, um, but I can't see myself supporting a budget that cuts services. I can see myself supporting a budget that cuts money. But I can't see myself supporting a budget that cuts services. Thank you, Jonas. I, I think we need to give a little bit more clarity to to Megan. So, Kari, within uh, within the questions that we answer, because we won't have a lot of time between now and next Wednesday. So, we got a document with questions from Michaela that I think that it, that would be helpful. That was coming from from. From her today that we all received. If uh, we give a deadline for those questions to to be by the end of tomorrow, <laughs> by the community members yeah. and board members to be here, because always it, it wouldn't be fair. I don't want the staff to feel like they have to spend their weekend uh, answering and uh, answering questions. I don't know that we were going to be able, as we heard about it. Uh, I think our inclination now is not to go into the pilot programs, the pre-K, and the, so I don't want them to do extra work for, for that either, if that's not what the board is inclined to do. So we're saying, I just want clarity, we're saying 3B without the restructuring, the questions will be around that, and level services. Yeah. And Floyd, so, let's do, let, can we do Friday at noon, just because tomorrow at the end of the day seems a little rushed. I, I can't, Chris, because it wouldn't be fair. My, at noon on Friday, the board, the our staff will have to answer those questions through the weekend. They won't be able to use their Friday to to finalize stuff and then be able to present to us by next week. So I think it's we have heard a lot from. Uh, uh, so if the board has questions, deeper questions that they need to answer, informed by what the community has said. I think by the end of today, by the end of tomorrow would be fair. So they don't have to spend all weekend uh, doing this. That would be, it's it's a, it's a lot of work for, for the staff. Are we gonna get a copy of the 3B minus the combination? Yes, we, okay. we, will, we will try, we will get that before our meet. So just to think about it for everybody to put in perspective also, if we have a meeting next, which we have a meeting with more action items next weekend, the packet needs to go out Friday by, by noon so that we, everybody's able to look at the information by, so I'm not trying to be difficult. It's just the reality of what we need for being fair to our already overburdened administrators and, and, and staff. So, so by the end of tomorrow, I, and I understand we also have business tomorrow. The board has a meeting tomorrow too. So not for this. So we, if we can get it by the end of tomorrow, that would be great. And we're just looking at 3B without the restructuring and level services. Agreement, just thumbs up from board members so that the staff knows what they're doing. Eric, thumbs up. Oh yeah, there, okay. I see everybody now. So Meg, is that? Sort of clear as mud, but a little clearer. I think so. Not no, that is clear. That is. I helpful. don't know what you mean by. Oops. I see everybody now. To me, <laughs> I was like, "Who's talking?" Um, I yes, that is clear and helpful, and I and I think that is deliverable, so that you all have it in the packet to read in advance. With the caveat that not knowing what the list of questions is, if there is a question that can't be answered by Friday afternoon, it won't go in the packet and we'll do the best we can for the following day. It feels like it's doable with that caveat. If I could, I wasn't, I didn't have any expectation that the answers would be in the packet. I thought, you know, by Tuesday next week was, was what I had in mind. Thank you for that, Kari. I did not, I was not thinking, I was assuming people would want to read it in advance. Got it. Well, yeah. my understanding of what Kari was suggesting, and I don't know if this is feasible, is that it would be like a Google Doc. 
So it'd be a shared doc that we would see kind of live, but I don't know how legal that is. And I don't know, you know, and, and Kari, I don't want to be putting words in your mouth either. It, it would be against uh, the open meeting law. We would be having a discussion before having the discussion at the board meeting. That's how Google Docs work. If they're not legal, we can ask our council for advice, but it, we can't do that. So my intent was to have as many questions ready uh, and then if there's more questions, obviously the, the, the leadership team can answer, but I can't imagine uh, anything more clear than the memo that you have in your packet. So I think a concise memo of what 3B would be without the restructuring will be helpful too. Taking in consideration what we have heard from community members and board members. Uh, so another- Can I just up. ask real quick? Yes. Um, if the answers aren't going to be in the packet, like Kari said, and like you're just going to be able to bring them to Wednesday's meeting, um, could we get them in print at least at Wednesday's meeting? Some of us maybe need both print and audible information. Sure. We'll be in person on Wednesday, so that yeah. is easy to deliver. Yes. And if they're Thank printable you. form. So that they could be available for community members too, because I think that would be helpful if community members are showing up. Thank you. Just so we can post it somewhere on the website. Okay. Okay. With uh, with uh, with that, um, can we move into the tuition conversation? Yeah, okay. So in page 30, Suzanne I'm, and Megan, I'm going to need a little help from both of you because uh, we wouldn't, I think what we're going to do is lean to the more conservative, uh, but I would love the number for 3B without the restructuring. I know that Suzanne, you were working miracles there while I was trying to. Can you give us that number? Yes. Can I find the unmute button? That's the real question. <laughs> um, uh, da, 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 da. That would bring elementary to 22911. And it would leave secondary at 21413. Sorry, Susan, I was multitasking getting somebody in 22911. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. And the secondary would remain the same because the change would only be in the elementary. Okay. And just for clarification, Susan, the for three three A it would be the twenty three four four three. Correct. Yep. Thank you very much. Yep. And for secondary three A is twenty two zero zero six. Great. Thank you. Yep. And and like Kari said, um, I would prefer that the board went more conservative, so went with the lower tuition amount, because even if you keep the higher budget, we can always go back and, and bill those schools later. It's it's a full like year after the after the year has occurred that we could bill them as long as it's within the statutory percentage overage. So I'd rather you you went under than over. So can, can you give us those numbers? What would you, the, just because we have already a recommended board action. So the board moved to announce that for the year 23, 24, it says 22, 23, but it should be 23, 24, right? Oh, yep, yep. Sorry, I didn't change that. Oh, yep. Okay. For elementary. Can you just say it out loud? Is yeah, it, uh, sorry, it would be the 22808. And then yeah. 21413. Okay. All right. Is somebody prepared to make, to make that motion? I can. Okay, Daniel. Can. Yeah, oh, I moved the board um, moved to announce the fiscal year 2023 2024 district tuition rates as 22,808 for elementary tuition. And twenty one thousand four one three for secondary tuition. Okay. A second by Chris. I heard. Yeah. yeah. 
Any more discussion or questions? Ursula? Can I ask, Suzanne, oh. what is the um, like percentage we can go over that you can like charge over? I'm so sorry, Ursula. I don't have that in front of me. Sorry, um, I didn't mean to throw no, a stumper. I should have. I should have thought to bring that one with me. I don't recall what it is, and I'd hate to throw out a percent and not be right. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye or yes. Aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? Any abstain? The motion carries unanimously. Okay. Thank you. All right. I thought I thought someone said they opposed. No. I don't think so. Yeah. Did I think it was a late I. Oh, sorry. Okay, thanks. Okay. I think it was the weird Alexa voice that's been haunting us all night. <laughs> I know. It, it, my computer here is trying to... Uh, Siri and I don't get along. They never understand me. I actually always have a different... It, they, she just doesn't understand me. She's been trying to introduce herself. Okay. Uh, now let's move into... <laughs> I'm like so fried. I'm sorry. Uh, for... Future agenda items. I think the if you would allow me, the the steering committee had a pretty robust meeting the last time about the agenda, and we looked at. And I hate to get away from process, but it is nine eighteen, and I think if we could adjourn, it would be helpful for some of our administrators and people driving home today too. I move it, to adjourn. Okay. I second. Okay. Uh, I will note that we do have another public comment section noted here. So if there are okay. members of the public who want to raise their hands, I think we owe it to them. Yes, totally. I, yeah, I, I try to get everybody in before. But if there is, thank you, Jonas. I totally missed that. If there's any other member of the public that would like to speak, I see Sarah raise her hand. Go ahead, Sarah. <coughs> Hi there, I'll be really brief. Um, I feel like um, something that did not get discussed very much. I know we really focused. I'm again, I'm I'm from Worcester um, talking, you know, my kids go to Doty. Um, I feel like the pre-K program and the sixth grade, you know, program that really got a lot of attention tonight. Um, and I feel like the the 90 second, you know, limit was was really difficult to work within. I, I totally understand why it existed. Um, but I do feel like the nursing, um, cutting school nurses is really, really concerning to me. And I know that I'm not the only person who feels this way, um, especially being such a remote, tiny little school. Um, it is really, um, I can't even picture a situation, you know, like having a medical emergency and not having a, a trained professional like on site, like we're half an hour um, from the closest hospital. Um, and just from a parent's perspective, um, my son has Tourette's. We found that out, you know, a year and a half ago, like right before we moved here. Um, and Nurse Jess at Doty has been one of the amazing supports for our son. Um, he, her office is a very safe place that he can just go if he's having a, like a lot of anxiety and a lot of like a hard time in school. Um, and I feel like as if that as it's such a small school anyways and there's a lot of like combined spaces in Doty there are not very many areas even physically in that school that would create something like that and and the care and support that Jess specifically has um offered to not just my son but many students there um apart from just being a trained medical professional like is like should not go unnoticed um and that that is when I found out that that was something that was even being considered cut, I was shocked because I didn't think that was a thing you could cut. That feels like a mission critical kind of um, position. And I just wanted to put that out there and I intended to write that down as well in an email to you all. Um, but thank you. I won't keep you any longer, yeah. you guys. Yeah. Um, Kathleen, uh, you're next, but I'm gonna let Sonia go before and then Patrick just because you had an opportunity to speak before so if you would allow me i'll go to sonia first then i believe that's you patrick and ipad nine 
and then we'll go back to you, Kathleen. And I'm gonna I'm trying to be fair, so I'm gonna stay with the time limit. I just forgot to put a timer, okay? Okay, well, I think you guys got a lot of our information. Oh, first off, I'm Sonia Rhodes. I'm at Doty. Um, I've been there since 1997, um, was hired when we had a bubble. And if I the number stayed up, I continued to be there. I just wanted to thank you guys for re-looking at making Doty um, not part of this pilot program and that we really look at um, and remember, and I appreciate those by those of you who think of our students and truly who they are, because I would have hated to try this pilot po program, as Gillian said, not really well vetted out um, on the backs of our students. Um, I believe in Doty, love Doty. I know as a negotiator and against you guys for a lot of times I'm negotiating for the union, it's a tough job. And I also want to say that I and other people will go and support you in creative thinking because I think we all want to keep that vibrancy throughout the district. And we not only will go and you know stand up to support, but we want to help be part of this year-round process and get our voices heard in some creative things that actually work for all our students. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, Patrick. Yes, hi, thank you. I know it's late and everybody wants to go home, so I'll be very quick. Um, thank you all for all of your hard work here. Thank you for doing this process. The community asked for it, you responded. Um, thank you to Megan and the administrative team for providing a budget narrative. It is so helpful. What, uh, two quick things to ask um, before the next meeting are one, please upload Megan's presentations uh, to the board website um, so they can be there with the packet because they are really helpful for the community to see. In addition, um, I think the most salient metric um, with all these numbers for people in the community to see is with each budget side-by-side -side comparisons of the cost per $100,000 in home value. I don't see that in the packet. It might have been shown tonight. I had to put our kids to sleep. Um, but if you can, I, I strongly encourage including that so everybody in the community and all of the board members can see that because that really brings it home. Is it $20 a year per family to cut these programs? Is it 60? People can evaluate when they see prices per $100,000. Thank you. Thank you. Patrick, uh, Kathleen. Yes, thank you very much. I just wanted to add something based on everything I've heard after um, hearing the board talk. And that is, um, again, I, I understand the inflation we're up against. I understand the declining enrollment we're up against. And I understand everything that the committee is up against. Um, I did want to reiterate the whole um, flip-flopping of, of a Worcester student that would be going to Romney for pre-K if five years down the line this comes true and that then they would be coming back to Jody and then they would be going back to Romney for sixth grade unless, as Kari said, by then sixth grade would be at U32. But if we're talking about equity, I just wanted to propose that maybe we split the difference and have, for example, pre-K at Romney and sixth grade at Doty, or sixth grade at Doty and pre-K at Romney. So not one school is doing the flip-flopping and it, the flip-flopping would be shared. Uh, that, that's just one suggestion that I had. Um, and honestly, don't really remember it this hour what my second point was. I, I know it was in regards to the nurses, um, but again, I just sort of wanna echo what has been said that I, that I do think those are, it's a critical position um, with all the social emotional wellness that's going on. And oh, I do remember my point, that scary statistic that Jessica, um, the nurse at Doty gave out that a lot of the underprivileged students that, mm. Thank you, Kathleen. Sorry. 
I'm just trying to be respectful to everybody. Is there another person that would like to speak? Otherwise, okay. We had a, a motion on the table to adjourn. Thank you to all the community members that came today. Thank you to all. Uh, we appreciate your input. Thank you for being here. It was a long meeting. Uh, doing this is, is, is hard, but I'm glad that we're able to have this honest conversations together and everybody's able to speak their mind. And here we are all working together. Thank you, students. Do you guys have anything to share? You are why we're here. And just seeing your smiley faces makes us all happy. So thank you for sharing your smiles. Uh, so with that, let's adjourn the meeting. Everybody's really tired. Have a good night, everybody. We'll see you next Wednesday. Please email your questions. Goodbye. Can we can we take I yeas and nays for adjourning since the motion oh, was so on the table? <laughs> A's. Yay. Aye. Yes. Bye. Sorry. Bye. Bye. Bye.